The Third Kingdom by Terry Goodkind Read by Gary Tipton Chapter 63 Colin caught the handle on the side to help herself stay upright when the coach bounced over a rut, abruptly rocking so violently hurt her abdominal muscles injured by the Aegeal. It still hurt to take a deep breath. Both the Mordsith and the abbot were watching her as they rode through a gloomy landscape of towering trees and craggy, inhospitable terrain. Colin turned her eyes to look out the window so that she wouldn't have to look at the two of them. It made her anger boil to look at them. It made her furious that they were doing this. The new world had for years fought a gruesome war with the old world. Emperor Jagang had caused incalculable suffering. There was no way to tell how many hundreds of thousands of people had lost their lives in that war. Families lost fathers, mothers, brothers, daughters, and sons. Entire generations of people had been wiped out. More people yet would be crippled for life. Many would not be entirely healed for years, if ever. And for what? So that Emperor Jagang could rule the world so that the imperial order could bring about their vision that everyone must live for the imperial order and their beliefs, live as subjects of those twisted ideas of the common good imposed by force. Like so many other rulers who preached a common good, they had been willing to kill everyone who didn't agree with their delusion of a better life. They had been willing to wipe out entire cities, the entire new world if need be, to have their way. The suffering they'd brought to the world had been staggering, all in the absurd notion of a better life for all. But Richard had led the new world to victory. Freedom had prevailed. The long ordeal, the suffering and sacrifice that sometimes seemed as if it would never end, it was now over. The world was at peace. And now these people from some forsaken dark land wanted to throw the world into chains again, just as the imperial order had done? And for what? So that they could rule? It was insane. Colin clenched her jaw as she glared out the window. What was it like? Colin frowned back at the abbot sitting on the seat across from her. What? His self-satisfied smile seemed comfortably at home on his features as he watched her. He could see how angry she was, and he was enjoying it. He was enjoying that he had taken her prisoner, that the mother confessor, the Lord Rawl's wife, the woman who had helped defeat the imperial order, was now nothing more than his chattel. I asked what it was like. Colin glared at him without answering. She turned her gaze out the window at the endless expanse of dark woods. The leaden overcast made all the trees look a greenish gray. The forest looked ancient, as if the world of man had not touched it. It was an uncharted wilderness, a primal, inhospitable wasteland, where death and decay was the way of life. The crooked limbs arching over the small road nearly closed them in, turning the poorly made road into a somber tunnel through hostile territory. They seemed to her to be like the great arms of monsters continually reaching for victims. It was as malicious-looking a woods as she had ever seen. A sudden violent blow to her face sent Cullen sprawling across the seat. She gasped from the pain and shock of the blow from the Mort Sith's fist. Her world seemed to tilt as it spun. For a moment, Cullen had trouble understanding where she was or what was happening. Her arms lay limp, one across her legs, the other hanging down over the front of the black leather seat. Cullen groaned as the pain from the blow started to blossom. Her jaw throbbed. Her lips and nose tingled as if from a thousand needles. Erica yanked Cullen upright by her hair and then backhanded her across the other side of the face, finally shoving her back into her seat. As Colin sat, arms dangling limp at her sides, she felt warm blood running down her chin, dripping onto her pants. "'The abbot asked you a question,' the Mord Sith growled. "'You had better learn to respect your superiors. If you don't wish to do that, then I would be only too happy to ask the driver to stop the coach so that I can drag you out onto the road and teach you to show proper deference and obedience. 
She leaned forward again, grabbing Colin by the hair, pulled her forward and put her face close. Would you like that? No, Colin said before the moored Sith struck her again. Erica smirked as she released Colin's hair, leaned back in her seat, and folded her arms. With the back of her wrist, Colin wiped the blood from her mouth. Abbot Dreyer watched in quiet satisfaction for a moment before finally repeating the question. I asked, what was it like? I expect an answer. Erica expects an answer. We are both burning with curiosity. Colin shot him a black look. What are you talking about? What was what like? With a fluttering hand, he indicated the long falling descent from a high place. You know, the drop, the fall from the cliff. You really must learn to be more careful. Being clumsy and falling like that could get you killed one day. So, what was it like? Colin could feel her lips swelling and the pain settling in in earnest. She wanted more than anything at that moment to strangle the life out of the man. I didn't like it much. He arched an eyebrow in amusement. Really? And why not? Colin glanced to the moored Sith and then back at him. It was frightening. He let out a brief chuckle. I imagine it was. He folded his arms as he leaned back, watching her. But that was the whole point. It had a point? He shrugged. Of course. I'm afraid I'm not very good at guessing. Why don't you tell me what the point was? Why, to scare the life out of you, of course. You were scared nearly to death, weren't you? You know, right when you were almost at the bottom, when you were about to hit the ground going full speed from a fall from on high? So the point was to scare me? All right, you succeeded. I was scared. Happy? He turned his smile on the moored Sith. She still doesn't understand. She will, the moored Sith said, rocking back and forth as the coach went over a series of bumps. Eventually. I suppose you're right, he said with a sigh. Colin sat silently, not wanting to give him the satisfaction of her asking what he meant. Aren't you curious? he finally asked. Don't you wonder how I did it? Colin knew exactly what he was talking about. He was asking if she was curious as to how he had managed to use his gift to stop her fall right before she hit the ground. Colin had grown up around wizards. She knew a lot about magic and what it could do. Those with the gift could lift things, even heavy things, and catch objects that were falling before they hit the ground. But they couldn't do that with living things, especially people. Life somehow interfered with that sort of manipulation. Something about having a soul prevented people from being lifted, except in rare circumstances and for brief periods of time. Even then, it required monumental effort. Otherwise, they would all be able to fly. They had explained the principle to her once, but at the moment it seemed unimportant. What was important, what was relevant, was how Ludwig Dreyer had managed to do it, especially with such precision that he was able to catch her that close to the ground and halt her fall. When she had stopped, her face had been inches from the dirt. He had then smoothly, gently lowered her to the ground. It was an appalling, frightful, horrifying experience that had left her shaking like a leaf. Yes, Colin said. As a matter of fact, I am curious. How did you do it? You obviously have the gift, a fact that you kept from us before at the palace. I've never known a wizard who could do such a thing. From what I learned, the gift isn't able to do something like that. He smiled with satisfaction. Quite right. The gift can't do such a thing. But you see, I have a different sort of power. The gift is the gift. Well, yes, that is true enough. But those of us like myself and Lord Ark have acquired the additional ability to use occult powers with our gift. The rest of the world simply doesn't understand the powers we have or what we can do with those powers. He gestured out the window. 
One of the advantages of living way out here, away from everyone else, is being able to learn such dark crafts from the cunning folk and then develop it into something altogether different, something more than they could ever imagine. But then they don't have the gift, and so they could never imagine such things. You should be very careful conjuring such dark arts. His smile widened again. She was getting tired of seeing it. His gloating seemed to be an end in itself. I am not afraid, he said in a low, dangerous sort of voice. Colin wanted to say that he should be afraid. She decided better of it. He brightened then. But you were afraid. When you fell, I mean. You were afraid. I already told you I was, Colin said as they bounced over a rocky section of the road. The jolt hurt her abdomen, taking her breath and made her jaw throb. At least her lip had stopped bleeding. That was what I had intended. Colin renewed the black look. I would think that you would have long ago outgrown scaring girls. The Mord Sith laughed out loud. She's funny. She looked over at Abbot Dreyer. She's funny. He made a face, but otherwise ignored the Mord Sith. There is a point to the fear, he said patiently to Colin. I'm trying to explain my purpose, and in that context, the larger purpose of my life's work. Colin took a deep breath. She didn't really want to talk. Since Erica had clouded her across the jaw, it hurt to try to talk. She supposed there was no avoiding it. Besides, she realized that she needed to know what the man was up to, what his life's work was all about, and what he was doing at the Abbey. She could tell that it wouldn't take a lot to encourage him to reveal such things about himself. I'm sorry, Abbot, but falling from a cliff and being caught at the last possible instant before smacking the ground is all new to me. I'm afraid that if you have some purpose in doing it, that purpose is lost on me. He dispensed with the smile as he leaned in toward her. Right there at the end, right at that last instant before you knew with absolute certainty that you were about to die, did you have any revelations, any last thoughts, any memories of the meaning of your life? In rare near-death encounters, many people say that they experience in a single instant the entirety of their life, see it all. So I was wondering what your last thoughts were in that final instant before you knew that you were about to die. Cullen had to look away from his eyes. She stared out the window instead, watching the endless expanse of trees and limbs flash past the coach. Well, he asked, what last thought did you have? You wouldn't understand, she said in a quiet voice without looking at him. They rode in silence for a moment. In that case, he finally said, why don't you explain it to me? She knew it was not simple curiosity. It was a request she dared not ignore. I experienced the total and complete feelings I have for my husband. He held up a finger. Ah, love. She was about to say that he wouldn't know what love really was, but decided not to waste the effort. Well, you see, the thing is, he went on as he picked at one of his fingernails, we have learned through our abilities with occult powers how to alter that experience. Colin's eyes turned to him. Alter the experience? The experience of death? What do you mean? In that last instant before death, real, certain death, actual death, people experience many different things. They may experience regret, paralyzing fear, love, even the instantaneous memory of the sum of their entire life, as I hear it told, that sort of thing. So? Well, you see, we... By we, I mean I, of course... I have learned through long experimentation and effort how to alter that experience so that those about to pass through the veil and into the world of the dead are able to do something useful for those of us remaining behind in the world of life. Colin frowned, now sincerely curious. Useful? 
What could you possibly get from people right before they die that is useful to you? His smile returned, but this time there was no amusement in it, no gloating. It was as malevolent a look as she had ever seen. Prophecy Chapter 64 Colin was stunned. Prophecy? Yes, we get prophecy. What are you talking about? Well, you see, he said as he leaned back, when altered through my abilities near the end of life, that life remaining within a person, the life that is draining away is altered so that in that last singular instant when they are crossing over through the veil for that brief flicker of time when they are still holding on to life and at the same time touching death, rather than seeing their life's experiences or feeling some sense of loss or even feelings of love, they instead, because of the changes I've made within them, as they touch the timeless world of the dead, they are able to tap into that same flow of time that prophets experience. In that extraordinary moment, connected to the convergence of life and death, they are able to see the sweep of time, stand in its flow, and thus give forth prophecy, the same as a genuine prophet. Colin was horrified. You think that you can somehow use occult powers to get prophecy out of people as they are dying? He shot her a condescending look. It is a process I created and developed, thoroughly understand and control. There is no speculation involved. And you've done this before? You intend to do it again? That is the purpose of the Abbey. There I use this process to collect prophecies and then deliver them to Lord Ark, Lord Ark uses prophecy, you see, to guide him. Colin stared in disbelief. Are you saying that you take people to the Abbey and murder them so that they will cry out prophecy to you as they are dying? You murder people in the hope that with their last dying breath they will give you a prophecy? Murder? No, not exactly. We are harvesting prophecy from the great abyss of eternity. We are reaping what is there for those who know how to obtain it. Through murder, he dismissed the charge with a gesture. The people chosen to help us in this great work are not murder victims. To the contrary, it is an honor for them that they have been chosen to give their lives to such a noble cause. They may not be able to realize that right then, of course, but they are heroic people sacrificing their lives for the benefit of others. That's madness, Colin whispered. Madness? No, not at all, he said, prickling at the suggestion. The sacrifice of these few is all done for the greater good of the many. It is brilliant both in its conception and in its execution. Execution is the right word, Colin said. "'Execution plain and simple for your twisted cause,' he gave her a testy look. "'You do the same thing. "'We do no such thing, and you know it. "'You who use prophecy, those at the people's palace use it, "'those like your husband, who collect and hoard the life's work of prophets "'who have tapped that great flow of time from beyond, as I am doing, "'only to keep their precious prophecy in secret libraries.' so as to use it to control the lives of others rather than benefit those lives. Those who give prophecy, prophets, are also giving their lives into such prophecy, no less than those at the Abbey, and you suck dry that effort for selfish reasons, not for the common good, as it is intended by the Creator. Colin knew better than to say anything. He leaned forward and pointed a finger at her. You and Lord Rawl keep prophecy to yourselves in order to use it as a weapon to enslave people. We, on the other hand, use the prophecy we gather from those who make such a final sacrifice in order to help guide the lives of our people. We use such prophecy to guide the people of the Jin province. We don't hide it from them as you and Lord Rawl do for selfish gain. Prophecy rightly belongs to everyone, not just the few. And now others in other lands have asked to join with us and benefit from the insights we gain from prophecy. 
Cullen didn't bother to try to argue with such madness. She was sick to death of trying to make people understand how prophecy worked and how it did not work. She was disheartened with the lands that had left the Daharan Empire to follow Hannah's Ark for promises of prophecy freely given to them. In the end, people believed what they wanted to believe. The truth had very little to do with it. "'You have been chosen to contribute to this great work,' he said at last as he finally leaned back in his seat. "'You will in the end be one of those who gives prophecy to those who need it. Because of your renown, prominence, and birthright as a confessor, we expect remarkable prophecy from you.' Cullen glanced at the moored Sith and then back at the abbot. "'So you're going to kill me. Big surprise.' Evil men have been killing innocent people since the dawn of time. You were going to chop off my head, expecting me to babble prophecy first? Fine, just don't try to convince yourself that I lay my head on the block willingly. It will be a simple act of murder, nothing more, and certainly not noble. He dismissed her words with a wave and a sour expression. It's not that simple, the Mord Sith said with a knowing smile. Not that simple, Colin repeated. And why not? You said that you kill people so that they will give prophecy right as they're dying. That may be lunacy, but it is simple lunacy. No, you misunderstand, she said. I meant that the process is not that simple. They must be prepared first. Abbot Dreyer put in with a kind of twisted zeal. Prepared? How do you prepare them to be murdered? He lifted an eyebrow. Torture! Colin stared back. You torture people at the Abbey. That is the function of the facility, to process people on their path to giving their gift of prophecy. It is through torture that people are properly brought to that cusp of life and death and held there at the boundary between worlds until they are finally ready to accept into themselves what we offer them. Colin was incredulous. What you offer? What could you possibly offer them as you torture them? Release, the Mord Sith said. Release? Colin asked, still staring at them both in disbelief. Release? Abbot Dreyer confirmed. Only when they willingly embrace the greater good and allow themselves to be the conduit for this gift to mankind do we release them and allow them the privilege of crossing over into death. Colin felt sick. She now understood all too well the part that the Mord Sith played in this scheme. Erica smiled when she saw that Colin finally understood. There is transcendent glory and profound agony, the Mord Sith said with quiet conviction, as if to justify what they were doing. Glory, Colin said sarcastically, repulsed by the evil of it all. Yes, indeed, glory, the Mord Sith's wicked satisfaction in her work surfaced. We intend to bring you such glory as you cannot yet imagine. Ludwig Dreyer was staring at Colin. And then you, too, like all the others who have come before you, will willingly give forth prophecy in order to be allowed to cross over into death. Chapter 65 Richard sat on the stone floor of the cavern, his back leaned up against the wall, half dozing, weary from the inner sickness weighing him down. He looked up when he heard muffled voices, it was not Zed's voice, but voices outside of the barrier, out beyond his main prison entrance. Someone was saying something he couldn't quite make out. He saw movement on the other side of the undulating green veil, and then several figures came to a halt. It was not the kind of movement he was used to seeing from the writhing spirits inside the world of the dead who had been taunting him for days, promising him the peace of eternal nothingness, whispering for him to step through and join them in that eternal peace. These other figures were instead standing outside his green prison door. It had been several days since he had seen or heard anyone even passing by beyond that rippling wall of green light. At least he thought it had been several days. He couldn't be sure. 
It was hard to tell time in the timeless twilight of the imprisoning cavern. He had slept little and paced a lot as the time slowly passed. They had brought him no food. He had found a recess worn down into the rock itself by the steady drip of water. Over time, that slow, steady drip had hollowed out a bowl-shaped depression. That at least provided him a source of water, since the bucket was empty. But without food, he was beginning to think that maybe they had simply left him there to die. With the touch of death always there in the background inside him, he wondered if that poison left by the hedge maid might beat them to it. Richard had gone back a number of times to the place where he had talked to Zed, but his grandfather never answered. As he had paced, Richard had frequently checked the other openings that were also blocked by the greenish veil to the underworld. No word came back from beyond any of them. He wondered if the guards had moved people away from the cells near his so that no one could talk to him or tell him what was happening. It would make sense for them to want to isolate him. Richard told himself that it was either that or Zed had not returned because it was more likely that prisoners were stuffed into any handy hole rather than bothering to bring them back to a specific place. After all, the rock was honeycombed with caverns. He tried very hard to convince himself of that. He refused to allow himself to consider the possibility that after Richard had last spoken with him, they had again bled his grandfather and he had finally died. Richard reminded himself that Zed was stronger than he looked, and that he would hold on now that Richard was there. But what hope could there be just because Richard was now also a prisoner? He was more likely to die along with the rest of them. The greenish light abruptly dissipated, twisting as it dissolved like smoke spiraling up and vanishing. There were a number of shantuk standing outside in the maze of passageways, as well as a few of the walking dead standing farther back in dark openings, watching with glowing red eyes. The half-people stared as if trying to see his soul. The Mord Sith stood at the entrance. It was her shape he had seen beyond the veil. Richard stayed seated where he was. Down in the chamber where they had put him, there was no opening to the outside world, no daylight. So it was impossible for him to tell precisely how many days it had been since he had last seen anyone, or even if it was day or night. Since he had been left in his private prison, not even the Mord Sith had come to torment him, as Mord Sith were wont to do. While he felt weak from lack of food, in contrast, Vicar looked well-rested and fresh. With Mord Sith, that was generally a bad sign. Richard, though, wasn't in the mood for any of their nonsense or games. His time was running out, and his patience was well past wearing thin. Vicar stepped into his prison room in a commanding manner that brought back a lot of very unpleasant memories. He tried to remind himself not to impose past situations on this one. This was different. He was different. He had to think of what he faced now, not what he had faced in the past. The Mord Sith's single blonde braid looked clean and freshly made up. Her red leather was spotless and cut to stretch tightly over her muscular form. It is time, she said in a silky, cool voice. Time, Richard resting his forearms over his knees, didn't make a move to get up. Time for what? Time for you to come with me, she said with a practiced lack of emotion. Richard sighed and stood up before she came to retrieve him. He brushed the stone grit off his hands. He mentally readied himself for the dance that was about to begin. He took a calming breath. He was not going to let her lead. Look, Vicar, I know a lot more about Mord Sith than you can imagine, and I think you know a lot less about the outside world than you realize. You've been kept in the dark lands and at the same time kept in the dark. You need to listen to me. Darken Rawl was an evil man. Don't mark me with his crimes or sins. The world beyond the Jin province beyond these backward dark lands, has changed for the better. 
I know how Dark and Roll collected young girls to become Mord Sith, how they were trained. I can see why any Mord Sith would have left him. But I'm not him. I'm not like he was. I don't allow the collection of girls to become Mord Sith, and I don't treat those women who are already Mord Sith the way he treated them. The Mord Sith are my friends. She arched an eyebrow. Like Kara? Kara. Kara is here. Richard took a step forward. Is she all right? Is she safe? She is weak. From being bled? Vicar twitched a frown. No, she is weak from being your Mord Sith. She is weak because you are weak and allowed her to grow weak. Kara is a lot stronger than you could ever be because I allowed her to grow, Richard said through gritted teeth. She had the strength to grow into the person she wanted to be. You could never be as strong as she is. Please, Vicka scoffed with a roll of her eyes. Her ajeel doesn't even work. She is nothing now, she smiled. That is how Lord Ark knew that your gift really had failed. The ajeel of your Mord Sith do not work because your gift, your bond, has failed them. You have failed them. They are helpless now. You are helpless now. Richard had been wondering exactly how Hannah Sark had known about Richard's gift not working. It had been a simpler answer than he had considered. Did you talk to Kara? Did you try to learn anything about how things are now with... I talked. She listened. Richard didn't like what she was implying. You can choose to change, Vicar. Change? Like her? Become weak? I was at the People's Palace with Abbot Dreyer. I was there right under your nose, unseen, helping him set things into motion. When I was there, I heard talk, and the abbot confirmed it. He said that Kara, a moored Sith, had wed. I know, Richard said in a quiet voice. I'm the one who married them. Vicar, looking surprised, studied his face for a long moment. Why would she do such a thing? She is Mord Sith. She is also a woman, Vicar, just like you. She fell in love and wanted to share her life with the man she loved. Her frown returned. She looked sincerely puzzled. And you allowed this? Why would you marry them? Because I care about her, about all the Mord Sith. I wanted her to be happy. After what she had been through in her life, what all of you have been through, she deserved to have some happiness come into her life. The other Mord Sith wept with joy at her wedding. Richard tapped his own chest. I wept with joy for her. As Vicar studied him in silence for a time, he went on. She changed, by her own choice, changed to have the life she wanted. You, too, have the ability to use your head, to change. But the time for you to make that choice for your own life is shrinking. You still have the choice of setting things right and of helping me to set things right. That's the only way. Don't let the opportunity pass you by, Vicar. Once that chance slips away from you, it will be gone forever. She was incredulous. Chance for what? Chance not to be the property of an evil man. He is the Lord Ark, my master. You are your own master. You just don't know it. Her patience gone, her anger exploding to the surface, Vicar abruptly rammed her ajeel toward his middle. Richard caught the weapon in his fist before she could push it into his abdomen. Vicar held one end, he the other, and during the agony the way he had been taught in terrible lessons he thought he would never need. Now he needed those lessons. Now he was thankful for those lessons. Now those lessons were the only thing keeping him standing. He was inches away from Vicar's face, staring into her blue eyes and she into his, sharing the same pain of the ajeel that she felt, enduring it the same as she endured it. The Shantuck watched without reaction from beyond the doorway, without realizing the full extent of what was happening, what the two of them were feeling, or what they were sharing. The chalky figures with blacked-out eyes made no move to intervene as the two of them stood motionless, face to face, sharing the withering agony of her ajeel. 
Looking into her eyes, Richard finally saw the shadow of fear. After he saw that specter of fear in her eyes, after enough time had passed to make sure she understood that he saw it and recognized it, he shoved her back while releasing the Aegeal. As she watched him, panting to get her breath, her smooth brow drew into an emotional frown. "'You are a rare person, Richard Rawl, to be able to do that.' "'I am the Lord Rawl,' he told her with quiet authority. "'Despite what you may believe, I am in control, not you. "'Don't ever forget that, or it will cost you your life when you least expect it.' "'I expect to die in battle, not old and toothless in bed,' he finished. "'She frowned. "'So you know more of Mord Sith than I had thought. "'Vicar, I know more of Mord Sith than you can imagine. "'I know that they can choose life again. "'I know it isn't too late.' I have worn around my neck the Aegeal of Mord Sith who have died. Some of them died fighting me, others fighting for me. All of them were individuals who had the ability to choose more for their own lives than to be only Mord Sith. Some chose wisely, some did not. Vicar looked deeply into his eyes as she weighed his words. She finally lifted her Aegeal, pointing it at his face as the iron returned to her expression. I am Mord Sith. You will do as I say when I say it. Richard smiled softly. Of course, Mistress Vicar. He held his arm out. Now get going. You were supposed to come collect me for something. The pathetic excuse for a man who you follow will be angry with you if you delay any longer. That is the way he treats Mord Sith. No differently, really, than Dark and Roll used to treat them. "'Your choice to go with Hannah's Ark instead of Dark and Raw was no improvement. "'You traded one tyrant for another, that's all. "'But at least it should show you that you have the power to choose for yourself what you want for yourself. "'You made that choice. "'I hope that you will learn from it and come to make a better choice the next time.' "'She did not look pleased. "'I hope Lord Ark allows me to kill you. "'That's a false hope.' It just isn't ever going to happen. Her face turned red with rage. And what makes you think so? Do you really think that Hannah Sark would go to all the trouble he went to capture me simply in order to let you kill me? I hardly think so. He has much bigger plans than your amusement. He wants me for some reason. He is not going to let you kill me. And I expect that he has given you explicit orders to that effect. Isn't that right? You're right, she said in a calmer voice. You do have a higher purpose than dying by my hand. She lifted her chin. But that doesn't mean I won't enjoy your fate. Fine. Just knock off the empty threats. Now let's get going. Richard started away when she didn't. He stepped aside to let her to take the lead as she cut in front of him. He had pushed her enough. If he pushed any more right then, it would only harden her. Richard knew that he could have killed the woman. He knew how to kill Mord Sith. Most people didn't, but sadly, he did. He needed to get away and would have been willing to kill her to do so. But what ultimately prevented him from doing anything right then was the Shuntuck crowding the corridors outside his dungeon chamber, all watching him, along with maybe a dozen corpses standing behind them. He knew that she was the only thing keeping him alive right then. If he'd taken her down, they would have flooded into the cell and eaten him alive. Chapter 66 Richard glared at the grim faces watching him follow Vicar out of his prison, the dark areas painted in around their eyes with the chalky white ash smeared all over their shaved heads made them look like skulls with empty eye sockets. From that inner darkness they stared out at him the way a predator watched passing prey, and, given the go-ahead, these predators would have ripped into him in a heartbeat. Richard thought he could see in their empty eyes that they missed some inner spark, some connection to the grace and therefore to humanity. They were alive, after all, but they were empty, living vessels lacking a soul. 
Even so, he had seen the kind of emotion the half-people could exhibit when attacking those who did have souls. Then they could be frenzied, mad, maniacal killers, obsessed with devouring human flesh. With an escort of what looked to be hundreds of Shantak following behind like hungry animals hoping for a meal, Vika led Richard through a maze of chambers and passageways honeycombed through the heavily cratered and pitted rock. Behind them, the silent, ever-present, awakened dead followed, lumbering stiffly along, ready to fight on command to stop any threat. In places, the tunnels and passageways through the craggy rock led them lower, descending down into a series of natural caverns that grew in complexity and size. Passages and openings seemed to run in every direction. Some of the smoother passages looked to have been sculpted by flowing water. There seemed to be even more of the silent, ghostly white onlookers in every hole or pocket in the rock. Passing under a low opening where they had to duck under a leaning slab of rock that had apparently fallen and lodged against the walls to either side, they at last entered a vast chamber that appeared to be their destination. The arched sides and domed roof were different colors of tan, browns, and white struck through with rusty stains. Off in the distance, to the sides, near networks of holes and crevices riddling the outer walls, immense tapered columns hung from the ceiling above forests of their twins pointing up from below them. The enormous hushed chamber was packed full with what must have been thousands of silent half-people. The vast numbers of chalky white shantuck stood anywhere they could find space, on rocks, shelves, and ledges covering every inch of available space. Yet more dark eyes peered out from corridors all around the cavern, or from jagged openings and fissures in the walls. They watched from behind tapered columns of what looked like melted stone. Higher up, Richard could see them looking down from yawning holes leading to other chambers. In the light of hundreds of torches, Richard could see some of the walls sparkle, as if adorned with shimmering jewels. The floor of the immense chamber sloped downward toward the center, so that the Shantuck all crowded in together created what looked like a vast white bowl. Richard could see Hannah's Ark standing out in his dark robes down in the center of that milky basin. Even at a distance, Richard could see the man's red eyes watching Vicka in her red leather leading Richard into the cavern. The Shantuck shuffled back out of the moored Sith's way as she walked without pause, expecting them to move, as she led Richard downward toward where her master waited. In the center of the room, behind Hannah's Ark, rose a platform to the height of his hips. It looked like a stone altar that had melted into soft yellow and tan shapes, almost like drippings of candle wax that had mounded up over time. As he got close enough, Richard could see that there was a small, withered corpse lying on the rock platform. Torches all around, popping and hissing, giving off pungent clouds of smoke, lit the desiccated cadaver. As he got closer, Richard saw that the body was mummified and looked ancient. Dark, hardened skin stretched over the nose and face, so that the bones of the skull created a clearly discernible skeletal topography beneath the leathery skin. The carcass looked like it had ossified over millennia. It was hard to tell from the shrunken husk what the once-living person had actually looked like. Richard could see traces of whitish residue on the leathery skin. It looked like ashes or white pigment of some sort might have been rubbed onto the body at one time, likely as it had been prepared for preservation after death. Thin lips had pulled back from the teeth, giving the skull a grin. The sunken eye sockets showed indications that dark oils had once been rubbed around the eyes, so that now the sunken sockets were even darker than they otherwise might have been. The Shantuck, with their ash-rubbed bodies, dark-circled eyes, and painted-on toothy grins, looked like they were paying ghastly homage by trying to mimic the look of the shriveled corpse. 
As Richard got closer, he could see that the body was partially wrapped in what looked to have once been an elaborate ceremonial costume, and was now little more than darkly discolored remnants of cloth decorated with gold and silver medallions, strung together with precious stones. The robes lay open from the neck to the waist, exposing a skeletal rib cage. Taking a better look, Richard realized that the dark stains on the robes were from dried blood, relatively fresh blood. When he glanced down, he saw that blood also covered the floor all around the platform in the center of the cavern. It looked like something had been butchered. "'Welcome to the momentous ceremony,' Hannah Sark said. When Richard didn't answer, Hannah Sark lifted a tattooed hand around at the crowd watching. "'These people have long awaited the arrival of Fuhr Grissa Ostdrauka, for prophecy has promised that he will be the one to resurrect their king.' At the mention of the king, all the Shantuck in the enormous chamber went to their knees. The rustling sound of them, all kneeling in concert, echoed around the room, dying out slowly in a hushed whisper of knees against stone. "'And what are you doing here in their land?' Richard asked. "'With my help, the ancient gates that for so long held them captive in this place have at long last been broken open.' finally enabling them to bring in the living, those with souls, to help in returning life to their beloved king, the king of the third kingdom, who will become the king of the world of life and death, united in one purpose. In other words, Richard said, they are trying to use the blood of living people with souls to bring life back to a corpse, and it isn't working the way they had hoped. Hannah Sark smiled in a way that distorted the tattooed symbols on his face. Not a very generous way to put it, but essentially correct. In their ignorance, they believed that the blood of those with souls, strong soldiers, for example, would again give strength to their king, and that the blood of the gifted would give him back his powers in the world of life. In their simplistic grasp of ancient lore, they thought that if they drenched their king in the warm blood of people with souls, then it would bring warmth and life to him. That's it? Richard thought there had to be more to it. You're saying they believed that by simply pouring blood over a corpse, it would come back to life? Well, Hannah Sark admitted with a gesture, there was more to the procedure. Although they didn't fully understand the process, they weren't quite as ignorant as you make it sound. Along with the living blood from those with souls, they were to add in the vital component of the cult conjuring their kind had been taught since ancient times before they were banished, conjuring long forgotten by the rest of the world. Such spells and incantations have long fallen into disuse and have been largely forgotten by the outside world, but not here. All they lacked was the blood of those with souls, and now they have it. I don't know, Richard said. He still looks dead to me. Only Hannah Sark's red eyes betrayed his annoyance. The smile, as insincere as it was, remained in place. But even though it was hard to tell because of the way their faces were covered in pale ash and dark circles that made their eyes look like hollow sockets, there was no mistaking the silent displeasure on the faces of all the Shantuck watching. They were closer to the truth than you might think. Unfortunately, Hannah Sark said as he gestured to the masses, they lacked access to prophecy, or they would know better. Prophecy? Yes. You see, they had lost the living link to those who knew the old ways and could bring them the prophetic knowledge necessary to assist in their ancient task. Those who banished them to this forsaken land stripped them of any who might possess knowledge of prophecy. They were left as children, thirsting for knowledge, but it was beyond their grasp. He lifted an arm and signaled for someone to come forward. One of the bare-chested Shantuck women rushed down with a small pot, a bit like a teapot, suspended on a chain decorated with what looked to be gold-covered human teeth. She poured liquid from the pot into a half-dozen flat bowls set around the corpse. 
Another woman followed behind with a flaming splinter lighting the fluid. Slowly wavering blue flames sprang up, giving off a pungent yellowish smoke. Both women bowed to the corpse of the king before rushing away. So, Richard said, I take it that they have been missing your leadership for all this time, he met Hannah's Ark's gaze, and I would bet some other important element. Hannah Sark smiled again, but it was not what could be described in any way as a pleasant smile. Oh, yes, they have waited all this time for someone who understands how such occult procedures would have once been practiced. Such as all those spells and instructions tattooed all over you, Richard said, gesturing, all those ancient symbols in the language of creation. The man smiled as he arched an eyebrow. So you know something of these sacred writings. I've run into them before, Richard said, without saying much. So, without you, these children have been endlessly pouring a whole lot of blood over a corpse for nothing. I'm afraid so. But you know what they might have been missing. Precisely what they have been missing, Hannah Sark said with a small bow of his head. Prophecy dictates that for this to work properly... It requires something extraordinary. And you're here to provide that extraordinary final ingredient. Actually, Hannah Sark said as his small smile returned, it is you who is here to provide the extraordinary final ingredient. With your guidance, of course. Hannah Sark shrugged. Only I, a man who lives the ancient ways, practices the occult arts, and listens to the obscure whispers of prophecy, would be able to understand the larger picture of what this is all about, what was intended when this was all set into motion, and so could provide what they need. Only I would be able to bring the element of prophecy to such a task and thus be able to complete what no one else could. Prophecy, Richard repeated with a frown. I get the occult magic in a strange, sick, ritualistic way. And even the blood. But what does prophecy have to do with any of it? Hannah Sark arched an eyebrow. Prophecy reveals the extraordinary final ingredient that is needed. Richard sighed, tired of the game. And what would that extraordinary final ingredient be? To bring their dead king back to life requires life and death mixed together. It requires Fjör Grissa Ostdrauka, the bringer of death, to bring life again to the emperor. This time Richard didn't say anything. Ah, Anna Sark said, pleased by what the silence meant. I see that you are finally beginning to understand your part in all this. These people simply don't grasp how it all works. They didn't understand that this doesn't merely require the blood of the living with a soul. Rather, it requires the right blood, blood from one of them, one who is of the Third Kingdom, one who carries death within him and yet has a soul. There is only one such person, one such bringer of death, you, Richard Rawl, are the one. So I've been told. You dismissed my belief in prophecy, but it is my study of prophecy that has once again shown me the way. You are a fool for so easily shunning prophecy, and now it is going to cost you everything, Richard Rawl. Richard cried out as Vicar from behind him drove her agile into the base of his skull. Chapter 67 When Richard began to become aware of the world around him again, there was nothing in that world but paralyzed pain, leaving him frozen in place, unable to move. He remembered that shattering, one-of-a-kind pain from having the Aegeal pressed into that spot at the base of his skull, but the memory was nothing like the reality of it being done again. He realized that he was down on his hands and knees, trembling with the shock of what Vicar had done to him. His screams still echoed around the otherwise silent cavern. His tears from that all-consuming pain dripped onto the bloody floor beneath him. As the echo of his scream died out, the Shantuck all let out an otherworldly howling that in some odd way felt in tune with the unbearable ringing in his head. 
It made the air drone and vibrate. He felt that old, familiar, icy sense of helplessness and despair, the feeling that he had been traveling a very long road, and this was all there was when he reached the end of it. Despite all those around him, for Richard, at that moment, there was only the overpowering pain that gave him the sense of being entirely alone in the world, in his own private realm where there was nothing but the wasteland of suffering. Once again he remembered that old longing for death, for that release that would make the pain finally stop. He fought those feelings of hopelessness, fought the urge to surrender, to give in to it all, the haunting desire to accept death. It felt like that desire had always been there inside him, out of sight, waiting to come out. Death would at last bring peace, but only for his private suffering— he held on to the lifeline that it would not do anything to help anyone else or to end their suffering. But his death would deny these half-people what they wanted, blood of a living man with a soul to bring back the one who had been so long dead. Richard realized that he was trying to find an excuse to give in to death. Yet in that way, his death really would protect everyone else, so he wondered if it would be right to give in. Nadja's warning, though, had told him that only he could end the madness of what Emperor Sulachan had started, but only by ending prophecy. If he gave in to death, he would not have the chance to do that, and then, eventually, there would be no hope for anyone. He was the one. He was the only one to end the coming terror of the awakened dead and the half-people— of the boundary between life and death ripped aside to let death loose in the world of life. At the same time, he was also the one to bring back their king and free those monsters upon the world. He was both, he realized. He was life and death together. He was savior and destroyer together. That, too, had been the warning that Magda Cirrus had left for him. Richard watched tears of pain drip down under the floor of the cave, covered with the blood of so many people, Zed's blood, probably Niki's and Kara's, and those soldiers who had protected him so many times. Those people had come to help him. They had been willing to lay down their lives for him if they had to. In the past, many like them had. For all those people and more, he couldn't allow himself to be weak. For them, if not for himself, he had to be strong and endure whatever they did to him, so that once beyond the ordeal, he could find a way to help save everyone from what was descending on the world of life. It was up to him to protect their lives in return. They had been the steel against steel. He now had to be the magic against magic, even if he couldn't use his gift. As the ringing in his head subsided, he began to hear the shantuck all around, beginning to chant softly in some language Richard didn't recognize. The haunting sound echoed around the vast chamber, almost making the whole place hum. In a perverse way, it reminded him of the ancient devotion to the Lord Rawl. It was probably something like that, he guessed, some chant of dedication to their long-dead king. As the half-people chanted softly, Hannah Sark worked over the body of the dead man. He spoke in the same dead language, conjuring things Richard couldn't imagine. Some of the Shantuck brought bowls of oily potions forward. From time to time, Hannah Sark dipped a tattooed finger in them and used it to draw symbols on the dead man. As Richard watched as he recovered, Hannah Sark next drew emblems on the forehead of the corpse. The greasy lines of the design began to glow a dull yellowish orange, as if lit from within. Anasark lifted his arms, urgently signaling the watching horde, and the Shantuck murmured a new chant. As the sound of it built, he bent back over the body. Richard then saw the most remarkable sight, a sight both so terrifying and spellbinding at the same time that he could not look away. Anasark's tattoos began to glow. As he spoke the words of the dead language, the lines composing different symbols on his body brightened to the same luminous yellow-orange color as the symbol aglow on the forehead of the dead king. 
First one, then another tattoo brightened for a brief moment, only to fade as another began to illuminate from within in a continually rolling, ever-changing series. Hannah's Ark turned to those watching and lifted a hand as he shouted a series of words Richard didn't recognize. The coordinated shouts of sacred words and answer to each prompt from the man in the center rumbled through the chamber like thunder. As Hannah's Ark worked, laying down symbols in glowing lines on the body while symbols on his own flesh glowed in sequence as if in response to the symbols he drew, the Shantak began a new chant. A steady beat repeated over and over. Each beat seemed to ignite a different symbol. As the drone of it went on, the sound gradually built until even Richard felt caught up in its power, its perverse majesty. The symbols all over Hannah's Ark glowed in rhythm with the chanting, first one, then another, each brightening in sequence, then dimming as another took its place, one at a time in rapid succession, as if different symbols meaning different things were responding in turn to the murmur of the chant. Richard had never imagined a conjuring so complex, or one that involved so many others. At last, the tattooed man turned to the Mord Sith with a grim look that she had been anticipating. "'Get up,' Vicka commanded from behind Richard. Her voice, more than anything else, seemed less than real and more like a memory from the darkest times of his life. Richard didn't move. He wasn't sure he could. She leaned down and growled in his ear, "'I said, get up!' He could only nod weakly as he struggled to get his feet under himself. He felt her hand under his arm, helping to lift him and get him upright. With Vicka's help, he walked the rest of the distance to the corpse lying on the stone table. Hannah's Ark turned with a flourish of his black robes like some frightening apparition from another world, his red eyes fixed on Richard with fiery intensity. Vicka pressed her a geo to the back of Richard's head, immobilizing him in place. His vision blurred and twisted. He opened his mouth to cry out, but he couldn't make the sound. Vicka pushed his arm forward. Hannah's Ark seized Richard's wrist and pulled it close over the withered corpse. Richard was helpless to do anything about it. He watched as if from a different world. Hannah's Ark pulled out a stone knife, its blade as black as the darkest depths of the underworld. He slashed the blade across Richard's forearm. Richard didn't feel pain from the cut. The pain of the Aegeal overrode anything else, anything physical anyway. It didn't override the sudden ripping agony inside. It felt as if the knife had cut into that place of death within him, bleeding that along with his life's blood and his soul. Blood gushed from the gash in Richard's arm and out over the body of the king. Rivulets of it ran down the depressions between each rib. Hannah Sark pulled Richard's arm farther forward, holding it over the desiccated mouth of the king. When he seemed dissatisfied with the amount of blood splashed across the carcass of the king, Hannah Sark shoved Richard back out of the way. Richard saw his blood soaking the robes and dried flesh of the dead man. Bright red runnels ran down the rounded sides of the platform to join the darker blood all over the floor. After Hannah Sark had shoved him aside, Vicka pulled Richard back out of the way. He was too weak to resist. There was no point in trying. They were going to do what they were going to do, and there was nothing Richard could do about it right then. Richard went to his knees, too weary to stand. Hannah Sark's attention, along with all the Shantuck, was on the body laid out on the platform. He was too absorbed in what he was doing to care about Richard. Vicka leaned over and put her mouth close to his ear. Put your other hand over it. Richard heard her talking, but didn't really know what she meant. The lingering pain from the Aegeal, even though long since withdrawn, was still scrambling his thoughts. She grasped his left hand and placed it over the bleeding gash on his right arm. Press, she said in a low, confidential voice. Press your hand there and hold it tight. Richard nodded. Thank you. He wasn't sure what he was thanking her for. It just seemed the right thing to do. Richard saw that the king's whole body was beginning to glow, as if the symbols had lit something from within and there were a ghost now emerging from the dead husk of his body. 
Chapter 68 Vicar helped lift Richard to his feet. He felt dizzy and faint, likely from loss of blood. As the effects of the contact of the Aegeo to the back of his head gradually faded, he began feeling slightly more stable on his feet. Still, she had to help balance him to make sure he wasn't going to fall over before he fully recovered. It was the sickness inside, the pain of the poison from death's touch, more than the touch of the Aegeo that threatened to overwhelm him. He remembered Samantha telling him that he was going to get worse. He felt himself getting worse. What Vicar, and especially Hannah Sark, had done with that wicked-looking blade had made him suddenly worse, had weakened him, and made him more susceptible to the sickness deep inside him. The weapon Hannah Sark had used had been a sinister-looking thing unlike any knife Richard had ever seen before. It had a bone handle of some sort, no doubt a human bone, and a blade made of the blackest of glassy stone affixed to that handle with thin strips of leather that also looked suspiciously like it had been made from human skin. The flaked edge of the blade had been so razor-sharp that Richard hadn't really felt it cutting him. It had that in common with the Sword of Truth. The painted heads of the half-people bobbed up and down as they shouted in unison with grim exultation at what was happening. The entire chamber reverberated with the chanting. They were at last fulfilling their purpose. This was what they had been trying to accomplish for thousands of years. And Richard had been the one to help them accomplish their purpose. He glanced down at the grace on the ring he wore and remembered again the warning from Magda Cirrus that he could be the one to end the world of life. He feared that he very well might have done just that. "'What was that knife?' he asked Vicar in a flat, hoarse voice. "'The one he used to cut you with?' Richard nodded, not wanting to have to summon his voice again if he could help it. Vicar leaned close to his ear so that he could hear over the rumbling thunder of the chanting. She watched Tanis Hark to be sure he was busy. He wondered if she did not want to incur his wrath for disturbing him, or if there was another reason. "'It's a knife made by the Shantuck,' Vicar said. "'Lord Ark has several weapons made by the Shantuck. The Shantuck say that their knives can slay the dead. They talk? When they want to.' Richard wasn't quite sure that he understood what that meant. A knife that could slay the dead— but he judged it clear enough that he didn't feel the need to press for an explanation. He spotted a number of those dead that had been brought back from their graves and pressed into service as guardians for the Shantuck's underground prison. Now they stood like stiff corpses around the perimeter of the cavern, their eyes glowing red as they watched the proceedings from the shadows. Richard knew all too well that if they wanted they could move with surprising speed. He supposed that if they got out of control for some reason known only to the dead or the half-people, having a weapon that could put them down would be handy, if not invaluable. Richard had fought the awakened dead. They were not easy to defeat. It was a difficult task, even with his sword. He wished he still had his sword with him. He knew that in this place filled with the half-people and the walking dead, it wouldn't be likely to do him a lot of good in fighting his way out, but it would still be comforting to have it at his hip. If nothing else, he might be able to be quick enough with it to hack the dead king to bits. When he looked back to the altar just beyond Hannah's Ark, Richard's breath halted in his lungs when he saw the corpse take a breath. A transparent, bluish, ghost-like form now lay in the same place as the king's body. That foamy form began to stir. When it did, the body also stirred. The two, spirit body and dead body, moved as one. It looked like the corpse was possessed by a translucent ghost. When the Shantuck saw the movement on the platform down at the center of the room, some of them howled in jubilation. Others cried out in what might have been fright. They were, after all, seeing a king who had the power to return to the world of life. This was not only a master to be honored, respected and followed, but one to be greatly feared as well. 
Although this was something they had all wanted, the reality of seeing it actually happen was intimidating. This was also a new beginning for them, a new era. After several thousand years of waiting, the gates to their land were open, and at long last they had a real king, a king, Richard feared, who would lead them out through those gates on a mission of conquest and domination. Richard could tell that Vicka, even though she had played a role in helping it come to pass, was disquieted by what she was seeing. Richard hated that he was the one, though, who had played the pivotal role in bringing this evil man back to the world of life. This was a man who, in an age long past, had rained death and destruction down on the world. Now he was back, and Richard didn't think that his stay in the underworld had mellowed him. Without Richard, none of it would have been possible. The Shantuck might have played a part, Vicka might have played a part, and Hannah's Ark had certainly played a part, but Richard was the one who had made it possible. He had the potential for both in him, death as well as life. He was of this kingdom. He carried life and death in him. Good and evil mixed together. He was the one. Richard was the leader of the Daharan Empire. He had been named Fjord Grissa Ostdrauka, High Daharan for the Bringer of Death. He had just served in his role as the bringer of death. He had just helped spawn a great evil by bringing death back into the world of life. He knew that it was up to him to find a way to bring it to an end. There was no one else who had a chance to do anything to stop this. All he had to do, he reminded himself, was to escape the clutches of Hannah's Ark, a moored Sith, and untold thousands of half-people who could raise an army of the dead. After that, he only needed to end prophecy. And he had to keep himself alive long enough. The glowing figure of the king sat up. The Shantuck gasped with excitement and wonder. It was a terrifying sight to see a dead man awaken, even for them, but especially for Richard, and especially because of what it meant. The king's dried flesh seemed to have grown pliable, softened, no doubt, by Richard's blood as well as Hannah's Ark's dark conjuring that had united the spirit with its worldly form. With each passing moment, the dead man seemed to move with greater ease, even if not as fluidly as a living person. It was almost as if the transparent presence, the glowing spirit, was in part what animated the corpse. Richard wondered if what he was really seeing was the spirit of the dead king directing events from the underworld, directing events in the world of life. The bluish glow of the spirit actually looked more alive than the corpse. The face of the spirit existed in the same place as that of the corpse, so that the bluish glow of its features actually filled in the missing places in the shriveled remains, giving it a fuller nose, lips, and eyes. The new eyes saw. They looked about. They reacted. The revived lips smiled with malice at the world around him, a world to which he had once belonged. Anasark stepped back out of the way as the spirit king swung his feet down over the side of the platform. He sat for a moment as he gazed out at the adoration of the Shantuck, all of them in unison now thrusting fists into the air as they chanted as one. Sula Chan! Sula Chan! Sula Chan! As Richard had suspected, the dead king of the half people was Emperor Sula Chan from the Old World, and the Old War, his spirit now brought back to the world of life. Richard wanted to die and get it over with. Chapter 69 the way the spirit king held his blood-soaked robes to his chest with his left arm and loosely clenched fist gave him a kingly pose. He looked around the chamber with a measured, regal grace, taking in the veneration of the masses watching his triumphant return to the world of the living. As the Shantuck went crazy chanting his name, the dead Sula Chan finally began to smile in approval. The fluid gaze of the king of the half-people, once emperor of all the old world, swept over the masses, filling the cavern. His glowing eyes finally settled on Richard, his benefactor of blood. 
Richard glared back. He would have given anything for his sword at that moment. The awakened king dragged a finger through some of the still wet blood, Richard's blood, running down his bony chest. Richard wished that the poisonous touch of death that he carried in his blood would take the dead man back to the world of the dead where he belonged. He knew, though, that it was an empty wish. It was going to take a lot more than wishing to banish this man from the world of life. Sula Chan brought to his lips the finger he had run through Richard's blood. Tasting it, then closed his eyes with a look of rapture. He opened his eyes again to gaze deliberately at Richard. He smiled, as wicked a smile as Richard had ever seen. All the Shantuck in the vast chamber stopped a foot in time to their chant of Sula Chan, Sula Chan, Sula Chan. Still holding Richard's gaze, the dead king walked across the dried blood on the floor toward the man who had at last rescued his spirit from the underworld, Richard the One, Richard who had brought him back. Richard didn't allow himself to retreat as the king came to a stop before him. The malevolent smile remained on the glowing bluish lips of the spirit. Even the tight flesh beneath stretched with a self-satisfied smile. I have been to the farthest, darkest reaches of the underworld, the king said in an eerie voice that made Richard's skin crawl. I have been welcomed to travel the Keeper's realm at will. I hope you liked it there, Richard said with sudden venom of his own, because I am going to send you back there for good. The dead man's unconcerned smile widened. When in the darkest regions of that darkest of worlds, I met your father. I rather liked him. I didn't, Richard said. I'm the one who sent him to that dark eternity. I know. He told me. The king and his attention began to move on. As he did, Hannah's Ark, his tattoos no longer aglow, joined the glowing corpse of the resurrected king. Now that I have completed this part, Emperor, we have things to do. As they strolled past Richard, the dead king nodded, no longer interested or even seeming to be aware that Richard was still standing there. Our agreements will be honored, Lord Ark. I have given you my word. Let us begin, then. He lifted an arm, casually acknowledging the cheering, chanting masses of Shandak. I, too, am eager to begin. Richard wondered what exactly they were about to begin. As he went past, Hannah Sark flashed a dark, impatient look at Vicar while gesturing at Richard. Put him back for now. I will get to him later. Vicar, hands clasped behind her back, bowed her head. By your command, Lord Ark. Without a moment's hesitation, her hand came up under Richard's arm to turn him back the way they had come in. Richard saw that the dead king, in all his glowing glory, was listening to Hannah Sark's words, words Richard couldn't hear because they were being drowned out by the chanting. He could see Hannah Sark gesturing with his tattooed hands as he leaned in and spoke to the king. Over the tumult all around, the king could hear the words of that private conversation, but Richard couldn't. Richard could, though, read in the body language of the man covered in the tattoos that he was the one in charge. Sula Chan might have been an emperor who ruled the vast old world and commanded armies of wizards as well as endless legions of soldiers, but he had been a long-dead emperor trapped in the eternal world of the dead. Hannah Sark had been the one to use long-forgotten occult powers to help break the spells containing the Third Kingdom and awaken Sula Chan's corpse. Those powers, along with Richard's blood, had also created a link that had pulled the emperor's spirit back from the dark eternity of the world of the dead. Hannah Sark still controlled that link between worlds and thus over the king's stay in the world of life. Despite the dead man's imperious attitude, Hannah Sark was in charge and was not shy about exerting his authority. Whatever the emperor's grand plans from ages long ago might be, it was clear to Richard that Hannah Sark had plans of his own, and he intended the corpse of the dead Shantuck king to help him implement those plans. 
Hanasok would not have been foolish enough to pull a wizard of Emperor Sulachan's power back from the dead without knowing that he could control him. As bad as the resurrected king of the half-people might be, Richard was beginning to realize that Hannah's Ark was even more dangerous. Still, Richard wondered if the man had any idea of the danger in holding the leash to such beastly forces. Vicka pulled Richard onward up the bowl of the cavern toward the passageway back out. The Shantakul stared at Richard as he passed. This was the man who had brought their king back to life. They had been foolishly bleeding people to no avail, but now Richard's blood had at last done the trick. They viewed him with a kind of respectful awe. That, however, only put him more at risk from these half-people. As far as they were concerned, Richard's blood, and likely his flesh, had just proven to be extraordinarily valuable. He was sure that they would all want to be the one to have a bite of his flesh, a swallow of his blood, in the hopes of capturing his soul. A few reached out to drag their fingers through the blood on his arm. They brought those fingers to their lips, tasting what their eyes lusted to have. With Hannah's Ark well out ahead of them, Vicar realized the menace so close all around them and hurried Richard through the crowds. With a firm grip on his arm, she steered him through the pushing throngs of half-people, intensely interested in her charge. Vicka quickened her pace, elbowing her way through, eager to get him out of the room and the hungry gazes of the onlookers. Once through the mob of Shantuck and out into a passageway that tunneled back through the rock, they were able to make better time. She kept up her pace, knowing that he was a prize that Hannah Sark wanted for himself. By arm finally stopped bleeding, he told Vicka after they had gone on in silence for a time. Thanks. She shot him a dark look. I just wanted you to still have some blood left, in case they needed more of it, that's all. Don't try to read anything more into it. Richard was too upset to make a flippant remark. When they reached his dungeon cell down in the labyrinth of passageways and chambers, Vicka shoved him back inside. Some of the Shantuck crowded around outside in the corridor, gestured on her command, and the wavering greenish wall materialized out of nothing. He had heard that some of them had occult powers, even the ability to reanimate corpses. It appeared to be true. Richard once again found himself trapped in the cave prison with no way out, with thousands of half-people who wanted to eat the flesh right off his bones and lap up his blood not far away on the other side of that greenish veil, the boundary to the underworld they were able to control at will. If they could bring those greenish walls up, they could no doubt also bring them down. His friends faced the same peril as Richard. Even if he could do the impossible and somehow escape the half-people, without being able to get Zed and Niki out, he was doomed to succumb to the poisonous touch of death within him. Colin was no less doomed. Chapter 70 Hannah Sark led the King of the Dead out into the dawn of a new day in the world of life. Off behind them, the half-people, gathering in the tens of thousands, trailed behind at a respectful distance. More likely, he thought, it was a fearful distance. Anna's Ark paused when the king strolled to a stop to take in the sweep of the new day. Thick clouds obscured the sky as well as the higher peaks. Veils of mist dragged low enough to blur the tops of the rock spires. The crumbling rock pinnacles reminded Hannah's Ark of tightly bundled marsh grass, that had died and then turned to stone. Pieces of it flaked off the spires over time, leaving the ground covered with decomposing fragments of what looked like nothing so much as stone fingers. Everything in this place seemed to be old and crumbling and dead. The sparse shrubs and stunted trees that clung to life and crags and sheltered areas looked only half alive. It truly was a place where life and death coexisted. It has been a long time since I have been in this world, the spirit king said in a voice that seemed to come from both worlds at once. It is good to be back. At long last, after all I have accomplished in the underworld, it is time at last to bring this realm under control. 
Hannah Sark watched the newly united spirit and man look out over the dreary world of life. They had accomplished all that needed accomplishing in this forsaken place. Vicka had arranged for their departure and seen to it that the Shantuck had gathered the supplies they would need for the journey. Everything was ready. I want to be on our way immediately, Anna Sark said. And you plan on bringing the man whose blood you used? The king asked as he feasted on the side of the rock wasteland as if viewing a colorful field of wild flowers. Richard Rawl, Anna Sark smiled to himself. Of course. He needs to be made to feel the pain and anguish of losing his power and authority, suffer the humiliation of his fall from the leader of an empire to a nobody. I see, the king said without looking over. So, you plan to assume the burden and risk of dragging him along just to humiliate him? Hanasark frowned over at the glowing spirit. That is the idea. I have been planning my revenge on the House of Raw for nearly my entire life. I'm at last ready to take the rule of the Daharan Empire. He will see it come to pass. The glowing figure smiled in the way an elder would smile. Hannah Sark didn't particularly like the smile, but he waited for the king to have his say. I have had experience with such matters, and I can tell you that such men as those who come to rule empires do not feel humiliation at losing rule. They feel only a need to do whatever is necessary to get back on top, or for revenge. After all, do you feel humbled at all your family lost? I think not. I expect you to feel only a need for revenge. Am I right? Hannah Sark hadn't thought of it in that way. Well, yes, but I want him to suffer his fall from power. The spirit shrugged. You are wishing for a type of satisfaction you will never get. Powerful people who lose power do not feel anguish and heartache like a jilted lover. Anasark's brow drew tighter. What is your point? The spirit king turned to face him. You brought me in back from the world of the dead to my unfinished business in the world of life, and in return... I am committed to helping you to rule this world. That is what I am doing. By asking me to abandon my revenge against Lord Rawl? The spirit of Sula Chan smiled again. Do you know why I am standing here today, Lord Ark? Hannah Sark was pleased to hear Sula Chan refer to him that way, even if he wasn't pleased to be questioned. As you just said, because I used my talents to bring you back. If Hannah Sark wished it, he could also send the spirit of Sula Chan back to that eternal world. But for now, if his plan was to succeed, he needed what only Sula Chan could provide. Besides, the arrangement was well worth it, and Hannah Sark felt he was getting the best of it by far. The spirit smiled. Yes, but you only brought me back because you needed me, and you needed me because I long ago made myself invaluable to the right person. I could afford to wait. I had all eternity to wait. You were the first one to come along who was wise enough to see the potential if we joined our talents and our goals. Part of my value is my vast experience. That experience and rule can help you in achieving your goal. Hannah Sark frowned, not appreciating being treated as if he were an inexperienced subordinate partner. As far as he was concerned, it was Sula Chan who was the subordinate in their arrangement. He had, after all, returned to the world of life only as a result of Hannah Sark's power and ability. He might have all eternity to wait, but he had been stuck in the underworld for thousands of years and would be forever unless and until Hannah Sark brought him back out. If he was so smart, he would have been able to return to the world of life by himself. In what way does your experience benefit me with Richard Brawl? Greatness demands the kind of dedication to purpose that I have shown, that has brought me to stand in the world of life again today. I let nothing distract me from my goal. 
You, as well, have shown great dedication to the purpose of rule. But for those who would be great, there is no room for distracting fixations. Such distractions drain away your energy of purpose. That is why I asked what is most important to you, dragging this man along with us or ruling the world. Hannah Sark's mood was getting as dark as the overcast. There is no reason why I can't do both. You would be ruling one man when you should be properly devoted to the effort of ruling all men. You're saying that Richard Brawl is a distraction that could keep me from succeeding? The spirit shrugged. The world is full of distractions. It is the task of a great ruler to keep them to a minimum. Distractions drain time and energy from your primary goal. Hannah Sark glanced back at the milky half-people. Killers all spread silently out across the landscape behind them. He turned back to the spirit, watching him. Since the day my parents were killed at the orders of a royal, I have been planning my revenge, so that I... And why do you suppose that the House of Royal killed your parents, your father, the ruler of little, insignificant, far-off the Jin province? Anasark paused a moment, feeling the sparkle of mist against the tattoos on his face as he let his anger cool a bit. To eliminate the possibility that he might rise up and challenge for rule, the spirit smiled. That is why the House of Royal has ruled Dahara for so long. And the House of Ark has ruled Little Fajin province. The House of Rawl was focused on ruling, not on humiliating your father by making him watch them rule. They simply eliminated the potential for a challenge to their power. If your aim is to rule, then you should rule. I believe I can do both. So did Richard Rawl's father. He kept the distraction of Richard Wall around for too long, and in the end it cost him his life. A number of men like him have failed because they were stopped by someone who would never have been a problem had they been killed in the first place. Richard Wall is the leader of the Daharan Empire because he is strong and determined, and because Dark and Rawl didn't kill him when he should have. Richard Wall is an incredibly dangerous man— he is, after all, Fjord Grissa Ostdrauka. He is not a man to be trifled with. If you think too much of yourself, if you think you can control him every moment, if you think that your power is strong enough to best him and keep him down, then you underestimate him. You underestimate him at your peril. You may have him captive at the moment, but every moment he is alive... He will be thinking of how to kill you. He did not get to be Lord Rawl, the leader of the Daharan Empire, the man who defeated Emperor Jagong and the might of the old world, without being very good at what he does. And what he does well is to take down those who try to subjugate him. Right now you are making yourself his target, his primary goal, and I can assure you... He will not be distracted from that goal by anything. If he is dead, then you don't have to worry about any of that, and you can go on to rule the world. Hannah Sark's mouth twisted. I hate to admit it, but you may have a point. The man has proven how determined he is. The spirit king turned back to look Hannah Sark in the eye. Rule is the revenge, Lord Ark. Kill your enemy now while you have the chance, and then you can go on to rule. Ruling will be your vengeance. As your return to this world is yours? Sula Chan smiled a dark, vindictive smile. I will now be the one who in the end has triumphed over all those who would think to take my rule and banish me to the infinite recesses of the underworld, while at the same time banishing all those that I created. He lifted an arm around at the desolate landscape to this forsaken place. In the end, they could not contain any of us with barriers or even death itself. Now we will each have our way and our revenge. Being from tiny Fijin province, Hanasark had no means to raise an army to fulfill his ambitions of conquest. 
He commanded small numbers, really, and he would need vast might to take his objective, the people's palace, and rule from the House of Rawls' traditional seat of power. To take that objective, he was going to need an army. And now, through Sulachan, he had what he needed. He not only had the Shantak nation of half-people, he had at his disposal an endless army of the dead. Hands clasped behind his back, he finally looked over at the wise spirit king, a spirit Hannah's Ark controlled. The tattoos covering him had been tedious, time-consuming, and painful, but they had proven to be worth it. Those symbols in the language of creation not only helped Hannah's Ark pull the spirit of Sulachan back from the underworld, they protected him from the spirit king, should he not honor his commitments. They were, in a way, Hanasark's armor when dealing with things dead. Now that the barrier is down, there is no reason to remain here. I don't want to waste any time. We need to be on our way. The spirit king bowed his head. By your command, Lord Ark, he glanced back at the vast army of half-people. We all stand ready and march on your order. First I kill Richard Rawl, and then we march. A cunning smile overcame Sula Chan's spirit face. We should allow some of the Shantuk to feast on the captives. Let your enemy Richard Raw be among those eaten. Let him suffer the same terrifying death as the others. Hannah Sark shook his head emphatically. No. No, you're right that while I have the upper hand I should kill him. I've watched him over the years of war, and you're right about how dangerous he is. I must not take any chances. But now that the decision has been made, I want to do it myself, with my own hands. I want to watch death take him. I want to see the man die before my eyes, so that the threat he represents is ended once and for all. I want him to look up into my eyes and know that it is I, Hannah's Ark, banishing him to the world of the dead. Before he dies, I want him to know that I am turning the Shantuk loose on all his friends to devour the living flesh off their bones. I will see Richard Rawl die at my feet. The spirit lifted his chin as he drew a breath while gazing out at the desolate countryside. My first day back in the world of life, and already I am well pleased. Hannah Sark smiled, already envisioning the terror that Richard Raw was about to suffer as he met his sad, lonely, violent end. He motioned to Vicar. She took a single stride forward. Yes, Lord Ark? He couldn't keep the smile from his face as he looked into her blue eyes. Bring Richard Raw to me. His time to die has come at last. She tipped her head. Of course, Lord Ark. I will bring him to you at once. Good. And there is no need to be gentle. In fact, make sure he is suffering in agony first. Then bring him to me. Make sure, though, that he is still alive, so I can kill him. I will see to it, Lord Ark, she said in that chilling tone she had when unleashed to practice her skills. He gestured toward the distance. We're starting out at once. Have the Shantuk bring all our supplies first, then bring Richard Rawl to me. Of course, Lord Ark. I will catch up with you. He glanced over at the king. After I cut his throat with the same knife I used to bleed him over you, we'll drag him behind as we march and leave a trail of his blood for the Shantuk to lick up. Vicar looked from the spirit king's smile to Hannah's Ark and then hurried away. What a fitting and bloody end this is going to be for the House of Rawl, Hannah Sark whispered to himself as he started south. Once through the gates out of the Third Kingdom, he could turn toward the heart of the Daharan Empire. Chapter 71 The glowing spirit of the dead Emperor Sulachan looked thoughtfully out over the landscape they were passing through. As long as we are on the subject of rule, do you know, Lord Ark, that I commanded great respect and utter loyalty, that I was never challenged from within? Challenged from within? Hannah Sark was beginning to see that Sulachan had come back into the world of life with a lot on his mind. What are you getting at? I mean, 
No one within my inner circle of command, generals, commanders, advisers, ever rose up to challenge me, ever plotted to take my place. Why is that? Because I eliminated all of those who lusted to take my place, those who thought themselves more clever than I. Sometimes I eliminated them because I knew they were going to have such thoughts, even before they themselves knew they would eventually have such thoughts. With a thumb, Hanasark rubbed a tattooed symbol laid out along the side of his first finger. It was a symbol warning of hidden threats. If I might add something, the spirit said, glancing over at Hanasark in his silent contemplation. Please state your mind, Hanasark gestured between himself and Sulajan. We are of one purpose in this, after all. We both work toward the same ends. As you have said, you acquired a lot of experience when you ruled such a vast empire. If you have something useful to say, then I would know it. The spirit looked pleased. You have one who serves you with prophecy. Hanasark considered for a moment. A number of people served him with prophecy. They finally frowned. Do you mean Ludwig Dreyer, my abbot? The spirit glanced back at the vast force of devoted Shantuck blanketing the rugged landscape as they followed behind, flooding around the rugged spires. That is the one. Have you considered what trouble he might be? Trouble? Hanusark flicked a hand dismissively. Ludwig Dreyer is a petty abbot, a nobody. He doesn't even work at the Citadel with me. He runs a dusty old abbey off in the mountains. He performs a variety of services for me. In what variety of ways does this petty man serve you? Well, I sometimes sent him in my place on matters of state. I recently sent him to bring word to the leaders of other lands and the Daharan Empire of the value of prophecy. As it happened, Lord Roll had invited all the rulers of all the lands to the people's palace for a wedding. I had business with a hedge maid. He glanced over at Sulachan. And with you, of course. So I sent Ludwig Dreyer to the People's Palace in my place. He was to make overtures to other lands on the value of prophecy and begin the process of winning the loyalty of leaders to our cause, rather than the Daharan Empire. But his main work is to bring me prophecy. That is his job, the work of the abbey he runs. Anasark watched the King of the Dead walk in silence for a moment. They finally spoke what was on his mind. And has he ever told you how he collects that prophecy for you? Anasark cast about in his memory, trying to think if Dreyer had ever told him anything specific. It's all pretty routine work. He deals with country people, the cunning folk out in the less populated areas of Fijian province and the Dark Lands, looking for anyone with any modicum of talent at foretelling from whom he might be able to coax prophecy. Some such people are born with minor ability to see into prophetic visions. Ludwig Dreyer tests these people for what prophecy they might be capable of giving. If there is such prophecy among the country folk and he discovers it, then it should properly come to me. Lord Roll has always been secretive about prophecy and will not share what he knows of it, People have a right to prophecy. Prophecy is not the property of the few. It belongs to all of us. Unlike Lord Rawl, I understand and use prophecy. He gestured at the corpse walking beside him. After all, that is part of how you are able to be here in this world again. Had it not been for prophecy, I might not have unlocked the paths necessary to bring you back from the underworld. Sometimes those simple country people require an incentive to get them to concentrate their minds to such a complex task as giving forth prophecy. He pressures them in various ways to focus their thoughts on what we seek so that they will be able to give prophecy, if they, in fact, are truly gifted in the art. So he tortures them to get them to focus. Hanasark shrugged. Well, yes, on occasion, when necessary, I suppose. I leave it to him to decide what is necessary. I don't need to waste my time with such petty matters. I leave it to him. He is very effective at his work. He has brought me some remarkable prophecy. Not the prophecy I found myself from my own more in-depth studies that I used for all this. He swept a hand back toward the Shantuck behind him. 
for understanding how this fits into everything and for calling you back. But he has proven useful over the years with prophecy that has turned out to be not only true, but quite timely and useful. I have books in which we record the prophecy he collects. He sends it on to the Citadel. I'll look it all over, and then we record it. The Spirit King gazed up at a wisp of gray overcast trailing down. Do you know that he tampers with the world of the dead in order to obtain that prophecy? Hanasark missed a step. No. In what way? And how do you know? Well, since I exist in that underworld, I know what happens there. You would have been unaware of such things taking place, of course, but part of my value in this alliance is to know of events in that world. You have seen things of importance here, evidence and indications, while I have seen such things of importance there in that world. Yes, that has proven to be mutually beneficial, and it will be even more so in the future. But what of Ludwig Dreyer? What news could you have from the underworld about him? He meddles in things you don't know about. He meddles in prophecy in ways that you don't know about or suspect. I know this because he uses his talents to send tentacles in my world to draw out that prophecy. Hannah Sark's anger rose in a hot fury. For what purpose? The spirit king glanced over out of the corner of a transparent, glowing eye. What purpose, indeed? What purpose would a man have not to tell his master what he was doing, and how he was doing it, unless he has designs on one day taking rule for himself? Hannah Sark felt his seething anger boil to the surface. The glowing spirit leaned toward him. Now that I am risen from the dead and my spirit has joined us here, is there really any purpose for an abbot who schemes behind your back with a cult conjuring of his own? For an abbot who has designs on your rule? What possible service could he provide you that would be worth the risk? He gestured behind. You have all you need to carry out any order. These half-people and all the dead you can use are yours to command. You will have the world kneeling at your feet, begging to do your bidding. Why tolerate a potential threat from within? He smiled again. Why worry about a knife in your back? Why, indeed, Hannah Sark said through gritted teeth. He had always thought of Ludwig Dreyer as a loyal subject, with no interest other than to assist his master— he had thought him a man without any personal designs on ruling anything more than his abbey. Hannah Sark was furious to learn that after giving Ludwig Dreyer his position and trusting him with responsibilities such as going to the people's palace in his place and with speaking to leaders of other lands, the man would scheme to usurp rule. Hannah Sark wondered just how much his abbot had already done to undermine him. Dark thoughts of what he wanted to do to Ludwig Dreyer drifted through his mind. He reminded himself that it was still possible that it wasn't true. Sulachan could be wrong. But what difference did it make? Ludwig Dreyer wasn't needed any longer, and Sulachan was right that it made sense to eliminate the threat, or the potential for it to become one. The spirit king gestured back to the legions of half-people blanketing the landscape, moving like a silent shadow on their march. For your purpose, you don't need all of these here with us. Having most of them with us is more than enough. Once we get to where we're going, we will raise all the dead we need from the catacombs, the crypts, tombs, and graves. We will have all the dead we could ever need to accomplish what you wish to accomplish. It is impossible for such a force to be disloyal. You shall have a virtually endless army that will follow your commands without question or delay. You will rule without opposition. Hannah Sark glanced back at the half-people amassed behind. Besides sending some behind to feast on the captives, we should send others to the abbey. The spirit king nodded. So be it. He turned a little and lifted a hand, using two fingers to summon a contingent of the half-people to receive their orders. 
Hannah Sark knew from experience that they would be only too eager to be let off their leash to hunt the abbey, as well as feed on the captives down in the caves. The risen spirit king was proving to be useful beyond Hannah Sark's wildest imagination. He had never before had the companionship of such an equal in determination, purpose, and ruthlessness. Soon they would shape the world to their will. Chapter 72 Richard paced the length of his cell, going back and forth in the light from the soft green luminescence of the veil over the opening where he had come in. He could do nothing other than pace in frustration. When Vicar had taken him to the cell after they had cut him and used his blood to resurrect Emperor Sulachan, Richard had asked her what they were going to do with him. She had smiled in that profoundly disturbing way that only a moored Sith could, and told him that she would be spending time with him while the others would likely be given to the half-people who were eager to devour them for their souls. He supposed that after that the unholy half-dead would be coming for him as well. He had imagined it a thousand times over and then another thousand. He had tried to come up with some way he might escape once they lifted the veil and came for him. He could think of nothing that had even the remotest chance to work. He knew that they would flood in and overwhelm him. He was beyond distressed and upset waiting for the unknown. He wanted out. If he was going to die, he at least wished he could somehow recover his sword and die fighting. Better that than the end they had planned for him. If he could get to his sword, he might be able to at least kill the newly risen dead king. He thought that if he could get to his sword, he might even have a chance to kill Hannah's Ark. He spent a lot of time trying to decide which one he would rather kill, if he could only kill one. Without his gift working, at least with his sword, he wouldn't die helpless. But he couldn't do anything including trying to get to his sword, unless he could find a way to get out of the prison cell. He had thought for a time that maybe Vicar would choose to help him in some little way at least, but he had not seen her since she had left him after the ceremony. He wondered why. As he paced hour after hour, he was left to contemplate what Hannah Sark was really up to. He must have some grand goal in mind. Richard could understand the spirit of Sulachan wanting to come back to the world of the living in order to try to implement his plans. Nodja's account had been pretty emphatic about what he wanted to do. Richard glanced down at the ring that Magda Siris had left for him. He knew what Sulachan wanted. He wanted to break the grace. Richard went back to pacing. He knew what Sulachan wanted, but what was Hannah's Ark's role? He was not the kind to be a sycophant to a spirit king. He had to have a plan of his own, something he wanted for himself. Richard knew that people like Anna Sark only wanted one thing, power. The symbols tattooed all over the man spoke to the lengths to which he would go in order to obtain that power. He was deeply involved in the darkest of occult conjuring. Of course, with the war ended and the world at peace, at least until the barrier containing the half-people had failed and Tandasark brought their king back, the only real power left was the Daharan Empire. By getting Richard out of the way, that made it pretty obvious what Bishop Ark's intent had to be. He wanted to be Lord Ark and rule the Daharan Empire. Throughout his waiting and pacing, Richard had regularly gone to every opening covered by a green veil. At each he had called out, hoping to get in contact with Zed again, or with anyone. He wished he knew if they were still alive, still all right. He shouted until he nearly lost his voice. He never received an answer. There was no one imprisoned near him. He tried not to take that as a bad sign. He went back to wondering what Hannah's Ark and the Spirit King were doing. He wondered if they had already left— if Hannah Sark hadn't already left, he surely would have already come down to gloat to torment Richard. Richard wondered if maybe he was being kept around as a source of fresh blood in case Sula Chan's corpse needed a bit of freshening from time to time. Maybe the Emperor was waiting to see if he would need more blood. Maybe they didn't know and were keeping Richard for the time being just in case. 
Richard wanted nothing more than to have Sulochan come down to get that blood. If he got any chance at all, he was going to take it. He needed to rip that walking corpse to pieces, with his bare hands if need be, with his teeth if he had to. He might not be able to harm the spirit, but if he could rip the worldly part of him to bits, that might do something. He knew that such a battle would cost him his life, but it would be worth it if he could put a stop to what was happening. Besides, he was likely going to be fed to the half-people anyway. He could feel the sword's magic in the distance, but even though he could feel it, it was too far away to do him any good. It was like a connection waiting to be completed, waiting for him to return. He could sense where it was, but he had no way to get to it. If it were closer, he could summon it. He was bonded to the blade, and within a certain distance he could draw the sword to hand. He had done that before, drawn it to him, but it was too far now. Besides, it was beyond the green boundary to the underworld. Even if it were somehow close enough, and he called it to him, as he had done in the past, once it fell into the underworld it would be lost forever. He checked his arm where he had been cut. The wound had closed and was starting to heal, but it was black under the skin. He wondered if that was from the knife or from the poison of death inside him. He supposed that it didn't matter. He imagined that soon enough the Shantuck would finally be given permission to rip him apart. They were probably only being held at bay in case Sulajan needed any more blood. The others had probably already been sacrificed. Richard's time would come soon enough. They would likely feed him to the half-people before the poison inside ever had the chance to kill him. With grim curiosity, he wondered if that poison might kill the half-people who ate him. He supposed not. They were of the Third Kingdom. As he sat back against the wall, tossing small stones out of boredom, he wondered if Samantha had gotten away. He had no idea what she could do now that she was alone and so far from her home, but at least she had escaped Hannah's Ark's clutches. Of course, there was no guarantee that she had stayed out of the drifting greenish boundaries of death or out of the clutches of the half-people. She had wanted so much to come with him, to help him, to try to rescue her mother. She had wanted to help fight the threat descending on the world. She had wanted to carry out the duty of the gifted who had been left in Stroiza. She had shown so much resolve. He felt guilty for abandoning her, but of course he'd had no choice in the matter. Still, he felt bad. Having her run to keep her from being captured along with him was all he had been able to do. Richard slumped back against the wall, resting his forearms over his knees, he was exhausted from the captivity, the pain of the Aegeal, and with worry. He was weak from lack of food. Worse, he was getting weaker from the inner poison. Lord Rawl? Richard's head came up. He thought he heard a voice call his name. It was distant and rather muffled, coming through the wavering greenish underworld wall, but he thought that it sounded like Samantha's voice. Chapter 73 Lord Rawl? It was closer the second time. He was sure that it was Samantha's voice. Richard stood in a rush. Lord Rawl? That time the voice was right outside his prison cell door. Samantha? Samantha, is that you? Lord Rawl! Lord Rawl! Are you all right? Yes, I'm trapped in here. I can't get out. They stuck me in here behind a veil to the underworld. I know. How in the world did you find me? A woman in red leather saw me hiding in the rocks just outside the caves where they took you. Red leather? And she didn't take you captive? I thought she was going to snatch me for sure and give me to all those half-people. Most of them had already passed by near where I was hiding. She was coming from the caves to catch up with the men leading the half-people. But when she spotted me, she instead signaled for me to stay where I was, to stay out of sight and wait. I couldn't imagine why. I was afraid and didn't know if I could trust her. But I didn't know what else to do. If I came out, then the others would snatch me for sure. But then after a time, when everyone had moved on, she came back. And she didn't capture you? 
Samantha was quiet for a moment. No, I don't know why not. She stared at me for a long time, thinking about something, I guess. I stood there trembling, imagining she was going to feed me to the half-people I'd just seen go by. Then the strangest thing happened. She bent down and told me where you were. Richard was stunned. So, she's with you then? She helped you get down here? No, she only told me where you were being held. It looked like she had a hard time of deciding to do that much. After that, she went to catch up with the others. Do you know where the others were going? Most of them seemed to be headed south, back toward the gates we came through. They had so many shantak with them that it looked like the ground was moving. I couldn't see all of them, or tell if they were all moving south. I watched for what seemed like all day as they kept coming past. But I do know that some of the half-people stayed behind. So there are still half-people here in the caves? Yes, lots of them. It took me a long time to work my way down here, she said, sounding frantic. They're all over in these caves. Sometimes I had to wait hours for them to leave. Where are they now? I don't know for sure. I know that they patrol the passageways. Lord Roll, you have to get out of here. The half-people will come back through here soon. They haunt these caves like ghosts. I can't stay here. They'll get me. You have to get out. You have to get out now. Richard threw his hands up in frustration. I can't, Samantha. The half-people have the ability to banish the green veil, but I don't. I don't have a way out, or I would already be out. I'm trapped in here. Lord Rawl, I can't stay here. The caves are full of half-people. If I stay, I'll be caught, and— Listen to me, Samantha. You need to run. You're right. You can't stay out there, or you'll be caught. Get out of here. Get out now. I need you to come with me. Richard raked his fingers back through his hair as he growled in anger. Samantha! I found some of the others. What? When I was looking for you, I found some of the soldiers. I talked to them like I'm talking to you. They're trapped, too, on the other side of greenish underworld veils. There was a long pause. Lord Rawl, she said, her voice starting to choke with tears. I talked to my mother. Richard froze. Dear spirits! he whispered, not wanting her to hear him. Lord Paul, please, I need you to help me get her out. I can't do it. I need you. Richard's hands fisted as his jaw clenched. He told himself to stay calm, to think. He had to tell her the brutal truth. Samantha, you need to get away. I'm stuck. I can't get out. Save yourself. Your mother would want you to save yourself, to live. I know. That's what she told me. But I can't just give up. Richard leaned his hands on the wall beside the wavering green light. When he came close, the spirits of the dead on the other side became more agitated and pressed against the green wall, trying to get out, trying to get at him. Richard stared at them for a moment. He was one of them, in a way. He had death inside him. He was of the Third Kingdom. He was both life and death together. And yet he was trapped by death in the world of life. Lord Rawl! He could hear her weeping softly. He was her only hope. I'm sorry, Samantha, but I don't have a way to get out. But you have to. You're the one. The one, he thought bitterly. What good was it doing him to be the one? Richard straightened. He was of both worlds. He was alive, but he had death in him as well. He was already dead, but had life still attached to his spirit. It seemed so simple. Could it be true? Magda Cirrus and Merritt had left him a message. They had said... Know that you have within you what you need to survive. Use it. Use it. He wondered. Chapter 74 Samantha? I'm here. He looked down at the grace on the ring Magda and Merritt had left for him. It was meant to remind him of what mattered. 
The grace was a depiction of both worlds, really, and how life blended and balanced with both, the world of life and the world of the dead. It was also a depiction of their interconnection. Richard looked up. Samantha, I need you to get back. Get back away from the green wall. Lord Rawl, I don't have anywhere to go. I mean that I need you to stand back, off to the side. In case the boundary of the underworld moves, I want you back out of the way. Go back down the hall a ways. Why? What are you going to do? Hurry. We don't know how long before more of the Shantuck show up. Hurry now. Stand back out of the way. All right, she said from farther down the cave outside. I'm back out of the way. Listen, Samantha, if anything goes wrong, I want you to get away. Do you understand? Don't hesitate. If anything goes wrong, run and get out of here. Your mother would want you to live. Lord Wall, you're scaring me, and I'm already scared enough. There are human bones in some of the caves down here. That was discouraging news. I understand. But if I can't escape from in here, then you have to get away. It took me a long time to get down here, sneaking past all those ghostly-looking shantank. I don't know if I can get back out. I know it's frightening, but if this doesn't work, you have to try. Understand? I understand, she finally said. Now stand back. I am standing back. Hurry. Lord Rawl, you've got to hurry. I can hear voices echoing. I think they're coming. Hurry! Richard took a deep breath. It had to work. It made sense. As Samantha had told him once, he was of that world. He remembered the message left for him, carved in the language of creation. Know that you have within you what you need to survive. Use it. That was what Mogdesiris and the wizard Merritt had told him. They knew he would come to that place and read their message. They had left their ring for him. Still, he was loath to try such a thing. But he was dead anyway if he didn't at least try. Everyone would die. This was his only chance. He knew that more than anything, despite how he tried to convince himself of the logic of it, it was an act of desperation. Zed always said that sometimes an act of desperation was magic, real magic. He tried to slow his breathing. He couldn't afford to wait any longer. He had thought it through as best he could. There was no time to think it over any longer. It was out of options and out of time. They all were. He had to try. He looked down at the grace on the ring one last time. He looked at the lines coming out from the center, the lines representing the spark of the gift as it crossed the world of life and then went on into the infinite world of the dead. Each was a continuous, unbroken line crossing worlds. Richard steeled himself, gritting his teeth. And then he raced ahead into the glowing green luminescence that was the outer boundary of the underworld itself. The shock of it was like walking off a cliff at midnight. He was instantly lost in an eternity of darkness. There were no spirits as he stepped through into their world, as there had been before when he was on life's side of the boundary. There was no more howling, no wailing, no more wavering limbs. There was nothing. There was no heat, no cold, no light, only a kind of darkness that was beyond darkness. In a way, it reminded him of what it was like looking into a night stone, only this was more like walking into a night stone, or more accurately, being swallowed into that perfect blackness. He felt totally and utterly lost. Everything was dead to him. Chapter 75 Richard couldn't sense if he had been in that empty world for mere seconds or for a hundred years. The void was without sight, sound, dimension, or time. But then the darkness began to dissolve around him. The world came back in ragged patches, like being able to begin to see objects when first coming awake. The sensation accelerated, and as light and sound crashed in around him, he found himself standing in the cave outside his prison cell. 
He looked back over his shoulder and saw that the sparkling, wavering, greenish luminescence blocking the opening to where he had been held for so long was no longer there. Samantha's big dark eyes blinked as she stared in disbelief. Dear spirits, she whispered. Lord Rawl, you just stepped right out of the underworld. Richard looked down at himself. He appeared to be in one piece. He was all there. He wasn't bleeding. He wasn't in any pain. He felt normal, other than the persistent touch of death that still festered inside him. How could you do such a thing? Samantha asked. I have death in me, remember? Samantha nodded her head of bushy black hair, clearly not understanding. But how could you step right out of the world of the dead? Do you remember what you told me? he asked as he checked ahead and behind into the darkness. You said that I was of that world, the third kingdom, life and death together. Because I have death in me, I'm of both worlds. So you figured that if you are the world of life, and could exist here with death in you, at least for a while, then you could exist there, at least for a while, with life in you? Richard nodded. At least for a short time. She seemed to remember her overriding urgency, then looked around and pointed. The other voices I heard were down that way. We have to get them out. We have to get my mother out. Hurry before any of the Shantuck come back this way. Richard was nodding even as he was already moving. Samantha ran beside him. This way, Lord Rawl, she said as she raced out in front of him and then cut down another passageway to the right. It was dark in the rough, crooked tunnel, with distant greenish light reflecting off the rock in places, enabling him to at least see where they were going. Richard raced past human bones. They lay discarded, piled up against the walls, and drifted into irregular depressions to the side. Panting from the short run, he stopped when Samantha skidded to halt and thrust out her arm to point. There! Your mother? he guessed. She nodded. Hurry! Richard took a deep breath, and then, without delay, stepped into the darkness beyond the flickering green curtain. It was the same timeless black void as the first time. It was no easier to endure the uncomfortable, lost feeling of the timeless world. In a way, it felt as if he had never left. As the wall dissolved back into the reality of the world of life, he saw a woman with black hair standing speechless before him, staring with big, dark eyes. Samantha raced through the now clear opening into the room where the woman stood in silent shock. She threw herself into the woman's outstretched arms. Samantha looked like a small, frail, miniature version of her mother. Richard had expected her to look like her mother, but the striking similarity was more than he had expected. Sammy, the woman said with profound relief, dear spirits, I never thought I would see you again. This is Lord Rawl, Samantha said with a nod as she tugged on her mother's hand, pulling her toward the opening of the room. Lord Rawl? The woman's mouth dropped open. Yes. As she dragged her mother, Samantha waved a hand, urging Richard to come along after her. Hurry, Lord Rawl. We need to get the others out. Not needing the urging, Richard was right on their heels, following them out. Samantha raced down the tunnel a short way, before again skidding to a halt. She thrust out her arm, again pointing at a green curtain. There! Richard didn't pause to question. Without slowing, he raced through the green veil and into the coldly frightening void. As the darkness dissolved and the inner cell came into view, he found himself standing before a number of the shocked faces of men of the first file. They were packed in, filling the room. The ones sitting, leaning against the wall, jumped to their feet. Lord Rawl, one of the men said in surprise. Suddenly, Kara raced through the men, pushing them aside to make way. She flew into his arms. Lord Rawl, you're alive! You're alive! Her husband, Ben, the general in charge of the first file, was right there behind her. He looked as relieved to see Richard as Kara did, if more shocked. Kara, as frazzled as she appeared, had never looked so good to him. Lord Rawl, Kara said. You look terrible. Probably because a moored Sith has been using her Aegeal on me. What? Long story, no time, he said as he started pushing soldiers toward the now clear opening and out into the tunnel. 
Richard caught General Myford's arm, stopping him, and spoke in a low voice. Ben, where are the rest of the men? With a haunted look, Ben glanced over his shoulder at his men racing out of their prison. They've been coming and taking them, one at a time. Lord Rawl, I know it sounds crazy, but they've been taking them out and eating them alive. We could hear it. We could hear the screams before. I know, Richard said. I know. He let out a distraught sigh as he shared a look with the man. I'm so sorry. I wish I could have gotten here sooner. Ben shook his head as he looked Richard in the eye. We are here to protect you, Lord Roll, not the other way around. Richard? It was the muffled sound of Zed's voice off to the side through another wall of greenish light. He's in there, Ben said, gesturing to the side. We've been able to talk to him when we don't think anyone is around. He says that Niki is beyond in another cell on the far side of him. They kept the gifted separated. Richard wasted no time in asking any questions or saying anything else. There was no time to waste on reunions or explanations of anything. There would be time enough for that if they could escape the caves and the Shantuck that hunted them. For now, he needed to get the others and get out. Richard raced past the men and out the now clear opening into the craggy tunnel. He ran past Samantha and her mother to the next shimmering curtain of greenish light. Without a moment's hesitation, Richard plunged into the greenish glow. For an eternity he floated in a timeless place, and then, as the dark, timeless emptiness resolved into the sights and sounds of the world, Richard saw an astonished Zed rising to his feet. The old man moved with a pained slowness, as if he had been sitting on the stone floor for far too long. His wavy white hair stuck out in disarray. His simple robes were filthy. Richard threw his arms around his grandfather in a quick embrace, then hurriedly pushed away. No time to talk, he said to his grandfather before the old man had a chance to launch into a thousand questions. We need to get out of here. Zed flicked a bony hand toward the wall at the side. Nikki, Nikki is over there. Can you get her, too? Richard nodded as he first hurried his grandfather out into the corridor where Samantha and her mother waited. Zed took the woman's hands, expressing wordlessly his relief at being out and seeing her out as well. Obviously, the two of them must have talked. At the next sparkling greenish veil, the shadowed shapes of spirits beyond flailed and twisted expectantly as Richard came close. Again, without pause, he immediately plummeted into the world of the dead, his world in a way. Beyond the first sparkling flash of greenish illumination as he made contact, there were no spirits. There was nothing. It was a frightening fall through darkness, until the world of life abruptly crashed into view. As it did, Niki, in tears of joy at seeing him, already had her arms around his neck before he was sure that he was fully back in the world of life. Richard, how in the world? Later, he said, seizing her upper arm and pulling her out of the now clear opening. She peered around the edges of the opening as she passed through, looking amazed at seeing the deadly underworld boundary so abruptly gone. Out in the hall, Richard paused. When everyone started to talk at once, he held up his hand as he shushed them. Quiet. Half people are near and could hear you. We don't want to have to fight them if we don't have to, especially not down here. They instantly fell silent, many casting worried looks up and down the rocky tunnel. Richard also needed quiet because he wanted to go within himself and feel the link to his sword's power. He could feel that it was closer than it had been when he had been in his prison cell. As he closed his eyes and let the world around him fade into the background, it allowed him to embrace that faint inner sense. He at last lifted his arm to point. That way. He raced down the tunnel, winding its way through the pockmarked rock, at junctures of passageways taking the route where he could feel the strongest pull of the sword. He could feel himself getting closer to it all the time. He ran with a sense of urgent desperation to get his hands on it. Along the way they encountered bones pushed to the edges of the passageway. There were so many bones in places that they looked like debris that had been washed up in a flood. There were no large sections, such as intact spines, feet, or hands. 
All of the bones had been completely disjointed so that the individual small bits and pieces lay in dense mounds. All the skulls had been broken open so that the Shantuck could get at the brains so that only fragments remained. Richard, leading the silent group of soldiers and gifted, at last found the place where he felt his sword the strongest, where it felt near. He knew what it felt like to sense the sword, and he could tell that it was only feet away beyond another underworld barrier. He dared not call it to hand, though. He feared that if he did, he might lose it in the void of the underworld. He looked back for a brief moment at everyone's tense expressions, and then he stepped through the boundary into the world of the dead. Before the world even began to come back in around him, he already had his fingers around the hilt of the Sword of Truth. It was a huge relief to have the weapon back. He immediately slipped the baldric over his head and let the sword find its proper place at his left hip. Ben, get your men in here he called back through the opening where the green veil winked out of existence. He signaled with an urgent wave of his arms. There were weapons, swords, axes, pikes, knives, stacked haphazardly in the room. The half-people had thrown all the weapons they'd confiscated into the small chamber in the rock and covered it over with a wall of death. The big men of the first file rushed in, all of them retrieving weapons as fast as they could, passing them back through the ranks to men outside in the corridor, crowded in close to the weapons cache. None of them bothered to try to find their own. They were just happy to get their hands on any weapon handed back to them. Richard understood the feeling. He felt that same sense of relief at having his own weapon back. Out on the hall, as soon as they were once again armed, the crowd quickly gathered in close around him. Richard held up a hand before anyone could say anything. We have to get out of here, he said as softly as possible, but loud enough so that they could all hear him. We can talk later. Hannah's Ark could be around here somewhere, along with a resurrected spirit of... No, he's not, Samantha whispered. Richard frowned at her. What? He left. Him and masses and masses of the Shantuck. There's still a lot more left down here in these tunnels, hundreds and hundreds, but he and most of them have gone. Richard nodded, remembering that she had already told him that. All right, he said. There are still hundreds of those flesh eaters about. For now, the important thing is that we get out of these caves before they catch us trying to escape, and then get away from here. Niki ignored his urgency and placed two fingers against Richard's forehead. It's worse, she said quietly back over her shoulder to Zed. He nodded knowingly. Richard, it's important that we get you and Colin to the palace, Niki said, her face set with concern and urgency. We have to heal you both of what you both have inside. Kara looked around. Where is the mother confessor? Richard again shushed them all with a gesture. Colin was unconscious, he whispered. I had to come alone to get you all out of here. She is undoubtedly awake by now, back in Stroiza. She will be waiting for us. We'll need to go get her before we head back to the palace. But first we need to get out of these caves and out of the Third Kingdom. Come on, Samantha said. This way. Chapter 76 Without delay, the entire company raced off through the dark tunnel, following after Samantha. Holding her mother's hand, she ran like her dress was on fire. The tunnels were not really corridors, but rather a variety of natural openings through the rock. It was in part a cave system through hollow cavities, part natural channels created by floodwaters through the softer portions of the rock, and in part fissures in the more rugged stone. In places, the passageway ahead led them through long clefts where the rock had buckled and split. At other spots, they had to go through low passages under broad shelves of rock that were so low that all of them except Samantha had to bend at the waist so as not to hit their heads as they followed the steep ledge upward. In some places, they had to climb up into pockmarked networks of holes. After going under a series of flat shelves of stone, the openings found their way back into the cave system, which split into a confusing maze of jagged tunnels and rifts in the layers of what looked like melted stone. 
Some stone was sharp and jagged, while other openings they raced through had, over great periods of time, been rounded and smoothed by water. Many of the passageways had small streams running through them. In places, they had to skirt pools of perfectly clear, deep water. Other tunnels were crooked, cavernous passageways with many openings branching all throughout them. The entire subterranean world was so riddled with holes, openings, and rifts that it felt to Richard like it all might lead to the underworld itself. The greenish veils of luminescence that floated sporadically through the caves only added to the illusion. Samantha, are you sure you know where you're going? Richard asked in a hushed voice as he followed close behind her. I grew up in caves, she said. I remember distinctive things about the rocks and openings through them. She seemed to think that was explanation enough. Richard supposed that maybe it was. As a woods guide, he did much the same kind of thing when traveling through uncharted forests. He made mental notes of particular sites along the way so he could find his way back. She was more comfortable than he was underground, so he had to trust that this was her kind of world, and she was his guide through it. Still, he did remember certain landmarks himself, and he wasn't seeing them. This isn't the way we came in, he whispered urgently to her as they zigzagged among what looked like melted rock towers. I know, she whispered back. I had to find a way around all the unholy half-dead. Richard was glad to hear that she had used her head to find a safe passage. The way she was taking them was a route that so far had been free of the Shantuck. But he knew that the half-people would be patrolling the tunnels and could show up at any moment. Once they discovered that their prisoners were missing, all the Shantuck would be hunting them. He didn't know how much farther they had to go, but he knew he would be relieved once they finally reached the surface. He didn't know if they would be any safer above ground, but they certainly weren't safe underground. If they were attacked in the caves, it would be difficult to fight. They could be trapped by masses of Shantuck blocking their way from each end of a tunnel and then picked off one at a time. He reminded himself that they now had gifted with them, and that would certainly even the odds. But he also knew from fighting half-people that they didn't fear for their lives and were unrelenting in coming after their victims. If they had to fight off the Shantuck, Richard could cut them down with his sword, but sooner or later their numbers would simply become too much. He would eventually tire, and then they would have him. More troubling, though, was that he could only defend one spot, and they could come in at them from all directions. It was much the same with the gift as with his sword, if all they faced were the half-people and not the reanimated dead. The gifted, too, could kill vast numbers of an enemy, and Richard had certainly seen Zed use wizard's fire to take down hordes of enemy troops from the old world, but even wizard's fire had its limits. It had to be conjured and cast. Doing so was a great deal of effort, and it quickly became tiring. If the enemy kept coming in vast numbers, getting closer all the time, then even a wizard could be overrun. After all, they had been overrun and captured once already. And then there were the walking dead. The gift was of limited use against them. That was why, Richard imagined, the half-people, like those in Sulachan's time in the Old War, used the dead. They were not only very effective on the front lines, they were also expendable, and there was a virtually endless supply of them, so if nothing else they could wear down any resistance. Richard followed after Samantha as she made one twisting turn after another, following a convoluted route that only she knew back through rock riddled with passages, clefts, and a maze of intersections. She ran through the labyrinth like a rock rat, never letting go of her mother's hand, never slowing to consider the way. When they came to a particularly complex set of passages, Samantha stretched as she ran, looking back over the heads of some of the men to see Richard. She pointed and made a snaking gesture with her hand, indicating the turns they needed to make. Richard nodded when he saw what she meant and where they would need to go. He grabbed Nikki's arm and pulled her forward. Help protect her. I want to make sure everyone else makes it through this part here and doesn't get lost. I don't want to have to come back in here looking for anyone who got separated. 
Niki touched his shoulder in silent confirmation of the orders before swiftly racing forward to catch up with Samantha and her mother. Richard slowed his pace, allowing himself to fall back as the men of the first file ran past to keep up with those ahead. They were beginning to become strung out in the series of complex turns, climbs, and descents through the snarl of passages. Richard pushed each man down the correct tunnel as they raced past, lest they miss the turn. He urged them to hurry, pointing to make sure that they saw the correct turns to take up ahead. It was difficult to see in the near darkness. Only the occasional sparkling curtain of the underworld drifting through adjoining passageways gave them any light to see by. He hoped one didn't drift across to block their way, or worse, drift in from the side and separate them. Richard spotted Zed near the back of the line of men. He was managing to keep up just fine. He might have been old, but he was not only stronger than he looked, but determined to get away from the fate that had awaited them in the cave prison. Richard knew that his grandfather was staying near the rear because he wanted to watch their backs for any sign of trouble. Kara, out ahead of her husband, followed close behind Zed near the rear of the column of men. She saw Richard slowing to push men down the correct turn. Go, she growled ahead to him, motioning angrily to him over the heads of a congested knot of soldiers. Don't wait for us. Go. He knew that she wanted him to stay in among the protection of the men of the first file. Richard was determined, though, to make sure that in the dark cave none of them missed the turns they needed to take. He didn't want to lose any of them down in the tunnels. As men squeezed past him, he pushed them into the correct tunnel, frequently pointing the way ahead. Kara, in back of the tail end of the men, picked up her speed. She raced past an intersection to get to Richard. She was unhappy he was slowing down and wanted to get to him so she could protect him. Finally, the last two men dashed past. Just behind, as Kara cleared the intersection ahead of her husband, a flood of shantuck spilled out of several openings to the side. There was only one person left in line, Ben. Sword to hand, he turned to block the tunnel. The whitish forms of Shantuck crashed over him in a massive wave of bodies, taking him down. Richard and Kara skidded to a stop. No! Kara screamed as the unholy half-dead ripped into her husband with their teeth. Time seemed to stop. It seemed like Ben had a hundred of the chalky forms diving in on him like a pack of ravenous wolves. Richard already had his sword out as he raced back through the tunnel. He had to make it in time. He had never run so fast in his life. Blood splashed across the savage white faces as they viciously ripped out Ben's throat. Other mouths opened to try to catch squirting blood, hoping to catch with it the escaping soul. Richard screamed in fury as he ran toward the terrible scene. Kara bent at her knees and threw her shoulder into Richard's chest as he flew by, knocking him against the wall, blocking him from diving into the pile of howling, growling, writhing Shantuck in a feeding frenzy. It's too late, she shouted as she shoved him violently in the other direction. Go, go! Don't let his sacrifice be for nothing. Run! In shock at what he had just seen, Richard screamed, Zed! His grandfather was already turning back, arms thrust toward the Shantuck as they tore the fallen general apart with their teeth. The last thing Richard saw before an inferno of blinding yellow flame exploded back through the tunnel was that it was far too late to save Kara's husband. He'd never even had time to scream. Richard panted in shock and rage. It had happened too fast. The wailing mass of liquid fire that Zed sent back through the tunnel was deafening in the confines of the passageway. The tumbling flame exploded across the ground, splashing up along the walls as it flooded over the terrible scene, engulfing it all in a terrible, blinding conflagration. At least the fallen general would not be eaten by the beasts. He had given his life to slow the enemy in the hopes of saving the rest of them. Tears streamed down Kara's face as she shoved Richard. Go! Hurry! Go! And then Richard was running. Kara's hand on his back made sure she was in contact with him as she pushed him ahead of her while watching his back. 
Behind them, Zed was a dark, stick-like silhouette against the brutally intense yellow blaze. In the roaring heart of that blinding light, the dark bodies of the Shantuck were reduced to skeletons and then ash in little more than an instant. The lethal fire roared back through the tunnel, engulfing the leading edge of the horde coming for them. The screams of the Shantuck were blood-curdling. Those screams were not enough for Richard. Chapter 77 When they broke free of the caverns, racing out of the underground openings and out among the dark stone spires, they found themselves in the gloom of dusk. The day was dying in deep grays that made the craggy stone pinnacles look like shadows of spirits crowding in from all around. Yet, after the darkness of the tunnels, even this somber light seemed harsh. The silence, too, was oppressive. The silence was short-lived. The Shantuck, howling in wild fury, poured out of openings everywhere in the rock. They were aroused by the smell of blood and had their prey in sight. The lethal fire Zed had unleashed in the tunnel had only slowed them. It couldn't reach through all the passages to reach the masses of half-people after them. They hungered for those with souls. There would be no stopping them. They flooded out of places in the rock that Richard didn't even know were caves. They rushed out into the dying daylight, a howling, ravenous horde, pouring out from the rocks and flowing around the stone spires in unending numbers. Once out of the confining caves and in the open, seeing the masses of the unholy half-dead coming from almost every direction, Richard knew that if they tried to get away, they would be run down and overwhelmed. He skidded to a halt. As he stopped, he seized Kara by her wrist and tossed her behind him, out of his way. The storm of magic from the sword thundered through him, demanding that he strike. It was his turn now to unleash his own merciless hunger for blood. He turned to the Shantuck then and unleashed his lethal rage, both his and his swords, against the chalky figures charging in at him with lips drawn back and teeth bared. They came at him from every direction. His blade met the snarling faces, shattering the skulls of those diving toward him. Each swing splintered bone or severed heads. Bone, brains, and blood smacked the rocks all around Richard as he swung the sword without pause. Blood fell in a red rain. The Shantuck were being cut down by the dozens. Headless bodies, or bodies with only the lower part of their head, toppled and tumbled across the ground. Richard lost himself in the storm of anger raging through him. He gave himself over to it without reservation or restraint. All he wanted to do was kill these soulless monsters. The blade demanded ever more blood, and he was only too happy to oblige. He needed the blood of these animals more than he needed to live himself. He abandoned himself to the need to kill, to his rage at what they had done to Ben and so many others. Each body that fell only made him want to kill more of them. There was no way that he would ever be satisfied if even one of them still stood. As he killed men and women to one side, half-people on the other side thought they had an opening to get to him and take him down. Richard let them come, then spun, cutting two men in half with one swing. Legs without bodies folded and collapsed. Torsos trailing innards and blood hit the ground with heavy thuds. The severed ashen heads of yet more half-people thunked down on the rock, cracking as they hit from their violent, tumbling fall. Empty eyes set in darkly painted rings stared up at nothing from tangles of bloody limbs. As he screamed in rage while swinging the sword, the chalky figures toppled to the ground around him, headless, armless, lifeless. He didn't try to run, to get away. There was no getting away. There was only the killing. He stood his ground, slaughtering them as they came, until there were so many bodies that he needed to move out from the tangled mass of sprawling carcasses and severed body parts just in order to be able to fight. Gore from those cut in half spilled across the rocky ground. Blood covered everything. Where there had been the pale, ash-covered figures, there were now only bodies covered in a sheen of wet red. Running recklessly, many of the Shantuck slipped on all the blood and gore and fell sprawling across the ground. Richard stabbed downward at forms wriggling through the blood and the dead to get at him. 
Those who raced in toward him fell dead and dying around him as fast as they came, adding their numbers to those already piling up around him. It was not skillful fighting, not a gruesomely elegant dance with death. There was no artful cut and thrust, no graceful evasion and counter-strike. It was instead violent, mad, bloody butchery, nothing more, nothing less. Not far from him, Kara, with a knife in each hand that she had gotten somewhere, fought with a wild ferocity that was frightening to witness. Richard understood her savage wrath. He usually saw her fight with her Aegeo, but her Aegeo would not work because his gift did not work. His gift powered the bond, and without that bond her weapon was dead in her hand. So she had instead found knives. She was no less deadly with knives than an Aegeo. If anything, at the moment it looked like she preferred them for the manifest ripping damage they did, visible evidence of her rage. Off to the sides behind him, the soldiers of the first file fought with the same kind of grim fury, wanting to avenge the death of their general, a leader they admired and loved. The first file were the elite of Daharan troops, the deadliest of fighters, and they were more than proving it this day. By the way they fought, though, Richard could see that they were not fighting to save themselves. This was purely for vengeance. The first file and want of retribution was a sight to behold. Yet even as hard as they fought, some of those soldiers were swamped by the flood of howling half-people. He saw them go down, covered with dozens of the unholy half-dead wildly tearing into them with bared teeth. Beyond them, beyond the killing field, immediately around Richard, littered with hundreds of dead and dying Shantuck, Zed and Niki were unleashing their gift with deadly effectiveness. Off in the distance, at the outer margin of the raging battle, Richard could hear the roaring wail of wizard's fire racing through the murky air, lighting the stone spires with an intense yellowish-orange radiance before splashing down among the Shantuck as they raced out of the rocks. They were incinerated by the hundreds before even having the chance to join the battle. Despite how many of the savages died, more yet poured out to replace them. Richard heard rock columns crash down on the chalky figures as the great spikes of spires toppled among them, no doubt brought down by Niki or Samantha and her mother. The falling stone crushed great numbers of them at a time. Great boulders and whole sections of fractured spires tumbled down and bounced across the ground, collecting helpless Shantuck before they were able to get out of the way. The earth shook with the thunderous explosion of wizard's fire, as well as the boom of rock towers hitting the ground and shattering. Massive rocks hitting the ground and splitting sounded like the crack of lightning. Yet even the roar of wizard's fire, the booming crack of exploding rock, the shouts of the soldiers, and the screams of the dying were all only a dim drone somewhere beyond Richard's immediate attention. He was focused on the waves of chalky white figures as they raced in to try to get his soul. These were half-people who clearly wanted him above all the others. They recognized that it was his blood that had brought back their king. They wanted that blood. They wanted his soul for themselves. That was just fine with Richard. He was pleased that they were coming for him with such passion, that they wanted at him above all else. It gave him more to kill. Despite how weary his arms were and how out of breath he was, Richard never for a moment paused in killing them as they came. He never slowed. If anything, his rage was only building, fed by the unleashed anger from the sword. That anger fed his, powered the blade, made him more deadly, drove his need to kill. He was lost in a world of his own, focused entirely on the task. Yet somewhere in the back of his mind, Richard knew that he wasn't going to be able to keep it up. There were just too many continually coming for him. There seemed no way to defeat them all. Their numbers were just too great. And then, in the failing light, in among the half-people... Richard saw the hulking forms of the walking dead finally emerging out of the caves. Chapter 78 The glowing red eyes of the walking dead stood out in the murky late-day light. They were slower than the Shantuck. That was why so many of the Shantuck had emerged from underground first. Now the dead were lumbering out of the caves, come to help reap those with souls. 
Richard furiously hacked his way through the half-people as he crossed the bloody ground to intercept the dark shapes of the animated dead. Their clothes hung in rotting tatters. Their dried flesh was as dark as the dirt-covered clothes they wore, so that they all looked like filth formed into men. As slimy and grimy as they were, it didn't matter to Richard. He needed to stop them before they could get to the others. He knew how dangerous these dead driven by occult magic could be. The soldiers would have more than a difficult time handling such a threat. Even the gifted's powers were no match for the occult magic that had been invested in these monsters. Richard vaguely perceived a figure in red, Kara, close behind him, going in for the attack with him, guarding his flank from Shantuck, turning to come after him. Richard redirected his attack from the Shantuck and instead went for the dead. With their glowing red eyes, they were easy enough to spot. Even the Shantuck kept clear of them now that they had been set with the task of killing. Richard gritted his teeth as he swung his sword with all his might, hacking apart the dense dark forms. Arms and legs fell littering the ground. Legs continued to twitch. Fingers continued to grasp. Heads and parts of heads spun through the air and cracked apart as they bounced off rock walls. All the while, fire tumbled and rolled across the ground, swamping the severed but still moving limbs behind Richard as he drove onward through the dead coming at him and the Shantuck baring their teeth, hoping for a bite of him. They tasted only steel. The air all around was filled not only with the smoke from all the fire, but the stench of burning flesh. Dust boiled up as stone spires crumbled and fell among the Shantuck. The night air was filled with screams of the mortally injured and those trapped under the crushing weight of toppled stone. Everywhere the mostly naked bodies lay sprawled across the ground. Their chalky white forms only served to display the blood in stark relief. Each slash that laid them open only looked more shocking because of the way their ash-covered bodies made the terrible wounds all the more horrifyingly obvious. Richard heard his name. It was Ed calling out to him. Richard, he called out. In a rage of bloodlust, Richard brought the sword up before him, looking for any threat. Even though it still felt like hundreds of the snarling, growling half-people were rushing at him, he realized that there were none. It was only the terrible images of them that he was still seeing flashing through his mind that made him think they might still be coming. But they weren't. He blinked. There were no more Shantuck charging in at him. They were all down. There were no more of the walking dead. They, too, were all down. In the stillness of the gathering darkness, Richard could hear the men panting from the effort of the battle. Some with wounds groaned. Some walked among the wounded Shantuck on the ground, stabbing any still alive. All the axes and swords the men carried dripped blood. All of the men were covered in blood and gore. Richard was covered in more Shantuck blood than any of them. He was soaked in red. Richard turned to Kara, a knife in each of her blood-soaked fists. One was a steel-bladed knife, the other stone, a Shantuck weapon. She had been using that weapon to put down the dead. Kara met his gaze. The rage in her eyes was frightening to see. It broke his heart. With his sword still gripped in his fist and the anger of the magic still coursing through every fiber of his being, Richard put his arms around her. Kara's arms hung at her sides as he embraced her tightly, and then she threw her head back and let out a single long wail. He held her close as she buried her face against his chest with a helpless sob. He held her in a comforting shelter for a long moment, he finally let her go and looked into her tear-filled blue eyes. There were no words as they looked into each other's eyes. There could be no words. When Richard finally turned back to Zed and Nikki standing close, the crushing weight of the world seemed to suddenly descend on him. He dropped to a knee, abruptly unable to stand. Kara helped hold him on the way down so that he didn't fall on his face. Niki and Zed were both right there, both helping keep him upright on his knees, letting him sit back on his heels. Through a torrent of every kind of pain imaginable, the power of the sword still in his fist sustained 
and supported him. He felt too tired to breathe and had to will himself to draw each breath. Both Nicky and Zed pressed their fingers to his forehead. Richard could feel the tell-tale tingle of the gift probing the poison deep within him. Nicky looked up sharply at Zed. Do you feel it? Zed returned her grim look and gave her a nod. We need to get to that containment field. There's not a lot of time. Where's Colin? Nikki asked as she looked around to see if anyone knew. Where's Colin? We need to get her back there as well. She will be worse than Richard by now. We have to tend to her as soon as possible. Where is she? We had to leave her back, Samantha said from back behind Zed. I healed some of her injuries, and she hadn't awakened yet. We had to leave her to rest and recover some of her strength. She should be awake by now and waiting for us back in Stroiza. South, through the gates, Richard managed. Then we go there first and get the mother confessor, Kara said with surprising power, courage, and determination as she stood over Richard's shoulder. We can't head back to the palace until we get her. It's not that far, Samantha offered. It's only a few days if we hurry. After we get her, then we have to get you both back to the palace so we can heal you, Nikki said to Richard in a confidential, worried tone. Richard nodded. He forced himself to his feet. Colin is in Stroiza. Like Samantha says, it's not that far. It's back near where you all were attacked and captured, after you came to rescue us from the hedge maid. He looked at all the faces watching him before turning his gaze south. Let's get going. There's still a little light. We leave now. Sword still in his hand, not yet ready to put the power of its anger away, Richard started out across the broken ground, walking over the bodies of hundreds and hundreds of fallen Shantuck. Kara was half a step behind his right shoulder. The rest of them all silently fell in to follow. Chapter 79 Hannah Sark turned when he caught a glimpse of the tall woman in red leather making her way resolutely through the whitewashed bodies of the Shantuck spread across the forested landscape behind them. Descending the slope, the vast army of grim half-people seemed to pour through and among the trees like a white avalanche. His mood darkened when he saw that the moored Sith was alone. He had been wondering where she was and what had been keeping her. Traveling across the desolate land of the Third Kingdom had been much easier than making their way through the uncharted forests of the Dark Lands. It would not have been so difficult with a small force, but the numbers they were dragging behind them were vast, and that slowed the journey. There were so many following behind that it took most of a day for all of them to pass one spot. The Mord Sith did not look at all happy. Seeing that she was alone made him more than merely displeased. Vika elbowed aside a silent Shantuck woman who didn't move out of the Mord Sith's way. Anna Sark could hear the bone of her jaw crack before she fell beneath the feet of the horde. So where is Richard Rawl? Anna Sark asked when she finally caught up to walk beside him. You had better not have let him die under torture. I want to be the one to kill him. The muscles in her jaw flexed as she clenched her teeth for a moment. Lord Ark, I'm afraid that it looks like he escaped. He shared a look with Sulachan. What do you mean, it looks like he escaped? The spirit of Emperor Sulachan asked as he came to a halt. Behind them, the progress of the Shantuck nation ground to a halt as well. Vika looked at Sulachan's ghost briefly, then her steely blue eyes turned to Hannah Sark as she answered. It appears that he somehow managed to escape. All the containment chambers were empty. The ground outside the caves was a sea of dead Shantuck. It was a slaughter. I have never seen the likes of it. The stench was unimaginable. Buzzards darken the sky. The ground seems to move as their dark bodies hop from place to place to gorge on carcasses. The dead have drawn predators of all sorts, wolves, coyotes, crows, vultures, foxes. Everything you can imagine is there picking over the remains. Scavengers have come from far and wide to feast. Hannah Sark's voice rose in a way that her eyes revealed she recognized as dangerous. Well, what about down in the caves? What about all the prisoners we left? Vicka swallowed. 
Lord Ark, they are all gone. All of them. The soldiers, the gifted, Lord Roll, all of them are gone. His brow drew down in a way that caused her to back a step. Richard Roll. He is no longer Lord Roll. That has been taken from him. I am Lord Ark, leader of the Daharan Empire, not Richard Roll. She swallowed again. My mistake, Lord Ark. The walking corpse of the Spirit King gestured. Or you will be, one day. Hannah Sark looked over at the glowing form of Sulachan within his long, dead, worldly form. He did not like to be spoken to in such a manner, even by the risen Sulachan. Are you suggesting that I might not be? That you and your forces might fail me? Sulachan regarded Hannah Sark with an unreadable look before finally smiling. Of course not, Lord Ark. Not at all. I am only saying that I warned you about Richard Rawl and leaving him alive. Hannah Sark's hands fisted. I didn't leave him alive. We put him in a prison, sealed off by the underworld itself, with an army of half-people guarding him and the rest of his people. Then I sent her to bring me Richard Rawl. He swung around and backhanded Vicka across the mouth with his fist. And she failed me! Vicka stumbled back three steps from the blow. As soon as she recovered, she quickly came forward again and kept her head bowed. I'm sorry, Lord Ark. I have failed you. I went to get him, just as you ordered, but he and the others were gone, escaped somehow. The Shantuck left behind must have tried to stop them as well, and they too failed you both. Why didn't you look for him? Hannah Sark demanded. Why didn't you go after him, find him, and bring him to me? She kept her head bowed. I tried to find him, Lord Ark, but they were gone. I checked all the caverns, just in case. They were empty except for masses of charred remains. Outside the caves there were so many tracks trampling the ground from— she gestured behind her— from all the Shantuck nation leaving that place, that there was no way I could even begin to track Richard Raw and the small group he has with him. For days I have been searching, but to no avail— I tried, but I have no idea where he went. It would appear, Sula Chan said, that Richard Rawl has managed to slip from your grasp. As I warned, he is dangerous. Hannah Sark gave the spirit a dark look, but didn't answer. I have failed you, Lord Ark, Vicar said. I deserve and gratefully accept any punishment you decree. My head, if you wish it, Lord Ark, he heaved a sigh, thinking. He was gone when you got back there, then. You didn't see or speak with any of the Shantuck we left behind to feed on the soldiers. You didn't see this battle. He was already gone. She kept her gaze to the ground. Yes, Lord Ark. As soon as you told me to go get him and bring him to you, I immediately started back. When I got there, it was as I described. The only Shantuck left there were long since dead— I went down in the caves and found all the prisoners gone. I spent several days, every moment there was light, searching for any sign of where they could have gone, but I could find nothing. He considered silently for a moment. The Shantuck stone-faced watched him. Sulachan watched him. He would like to kill the woman on the spot for failing him, but she had served him well for many years. She had never before failed him. Well, he said in a cooler voice, I guess I can hardly blame you for not bringing him if he had already escaped. And all of the other chambers where his companions were being held were empty as well? Sula Chan's spirit asked. She was obviously uncomfortable looking at the spirit, so she looked instead at Hannah's Ark. Yes, I don't know how they were able to break the veils confining them, but all of the ones over the openings into where they were being kept had vanished— I suppose that it's possible the half-people you left to feast on them took the prisoners out, and at that point they somehow managed to overpower the half-people and get away. So it would appear, Hannah Sark said, glaring at Sulachan, that it is actually your half-people, the ones you left behind to handle the situation, who are the ones who failed. No matter, the spirit king said, sounding unconcerned. We will have him tracked down and brought back. 
Alice Ark leaned toward the glowing spirit. How? he demanded. We don't even know where they went. The spirit smiled in that way that Hannah Ark didn't like. One cadaverous arm lifted, and the spirit king signaled to those behind them. Several Shantuck rushed forward and crowded in close to hear his orders. Bring me some of my spirit trackers. With a whisking gesture, they were sent running off into the ranks to do his bidding. Spirit trackers? Hannah Ark asked. I created more than simply one kind of solace weapon to serve me, Sulachan said in a patronizing tone. Some feed, some wield powers, some track spirits. I will send some of the latter back to the scene of the escape to pick up the essence of their spirits. They will track down and kill those with Richard Rawl. Then they will bring him back to you so that you can do what you should have done in the first place. I guess it is only a temporary setback, Hannah Sark met Vicar's gaze. It looks like you will soon enough get your chance to make Richard Rawl suffer, and then I will cut his throat and bleed him out at my feet. Vicar bowed her head. Yes, Lord Ark, I look forward to the day I might redeem myself in your eyes. He watched her for a moment, considering weighing her words, then turned to Sulachan. The sooner we get there, the sooner I take the seat of power from the House of Rawl, and the sooner I rule the Daharan Empire. I agree. The trackers will go after Richard Rawl for you while we will tend to more important business. Sula Chan held a long dead arm out before them in invitation. Shall we be on our way to the People's Palace, Lord Ark? It is a long journey. Chapter 80 Ludwig Dreyer tilted his head to get a better look as he pulled a handkerchief from a pocket and held it over his nose and mouth. She had lost control of her bladder, but that wasn't the worst of the stink. The smell of blood he was used to. It was the gagging stench of feces from her ruptured bowels that made his nose wrinkle and his breath come in short, reluctant pulls. It was one of the more onerous parts of his work. He stepped over the little river of urine running across the stone floor to get a closer look. The blood ran in every direction, so he couldn't avoid stepping in that, but he wasn't bothered by blood. He had been up to his wrists in it often enough. It was all a necessary part of his important work. He twisted his head to the side a little more to get a better look at her face. She stared unblinking at him with the one eye that wasn't ruined. "'Has she spoken any prophecy?' he asked the Mord Sith, standing behind one of the tightly stretched chains. "'No, not yet,' Erica said. "'I have been keeping her near the cusp until you had time to come and see her.' Ludwig frowned, trying to make sense of the tangled form. The chain was drawn tight, stretched from where it was pinned into the stone blocks of the wall to her bleeding wrist.' He finally realized how the arm was broken and twisted back around at an unusual angle, taking all the slack out of the chain that made her look so peculiar. He was pleased to at last unravel the puzzle and understand what at first made little sense to him. Erica had been busy, he could see. There was no doubt about it. She was gifted at what she did. But then, so was Ludwig. He heard small sounds. "'What was that, my dear?' he asked as he bent down. She was making small sounds he couldn't understand. He leaned closer. "'I'm afraid that I can't hear you. "'If you want to be released from the suffering, "'then you are going to have to speak up so that I can understand you. "'Please,' she wheezed. "'Well, now, you know what we want,' Ludwig said as he straightened. "'We've made it clear.' He gestured at the Mord Sith. Erica has made it clear, I'm sure. Speak up, then. The one eye stared at him, unable to look away. Please, let me die. Why, of course. That is why I'm here, to give you release from your agony. It had taken time to prepare her to bring her to this state. It was not something that could be hurried or done with haste. Ludwig had learned over his years of study that patience yielded far better results than trying to force the issue. 
slowly building the tension, terror, and pain in the end brought far better, far more insightful prophecy. The proper, careful building of their journey toward the climax of their existence brought the exceptional visions when they looked beyond into that other, timeless world. Those were the sort he sought. Rushing the preparations simply didn't produce quality results. Torture was a game of patience. He knew from experience, and the work that had obviously been done on her, that what information she did give before he released her into death would be some of the better quality prophetic perception. He was culling details from the darkest depths of the netherworld. He expected great things this time. He could feel it. He had done this enough to know when the information was going to be special, to be important, to be meaningful. Such especially significant tellings never went to the bishop. Ludwig kept those kind to himself. This one, he knew, would never leave the confines of the abbey. "'I'll tell you what,' he said down to the agonized face, watching him. "'I could give you a bit of assistance. I could help you bring it forth. Would you like that?' "'Yes. Please help me. Please help me.' That's why I'm here, he said with a smile. I'm here to help. Afterwards, I will grant you what you want most. She was close. He knew she was. When she said nothing, he gestured to the moored Sith. Without delay, Erica pressed her agile into the back of the woman's skull. She shuddered in agony. The chains rattled. Her mouth twisted as it opened. No scream could come out, no sound. Ludwig knew from experience that she was there, that she now hung between the world of life and the world of the dead. He knew that she was at last ready. She was now in that realm of the Third Kingdom. "'You see it, don't you?' he asked intimately as he ran a hand tenderly over her hair. "'You see that place beyond the veil?' The woman nodded as she trembled under his steady hand. You will first give me prophecy from the dark place you see. As soon as you do that, I will grant your wish and release you to cross over to eternal peace. You would like to cross over, wouldn't you? Yes. He could almost taste the prophecy right there, hanging within her like fresh fruit for the picking. He would have it. The mother confessor had been correct when she had once told Ludwig that if he was the one who provided the prophecy that Hannah Sark needed to rule, then Hannah Sark wasn't really the one ruling. Ludwig Dreyer was. At the time, he hadn't given it much thought. But as he had thought about it, he had come to realize that she was more correct than he had at first given her credit for. He had always known that Hannah Sark was absorbed in his own work and distracted by his own goals, so he relied on the guidance of prophecy that Ludwig provided. Since that prophecy was carefully culled, it was, in reality, Ludwig's surreptitious, carefully groomed guidance. Ludwig told Hannah Sark only what Ludwig wanted him to know from beyond the veil. What the mother confessor had said that day had really cast it with crystal clarity. Ludwig was the hidden hand that moved the puppet. Hannah Sark, as powerful as he was, as talented, as clever as he was, was too insulated, too consumed with his own narrow obsessions to know how things in the wider world worked. He could not accomplish what he did without Ludwig's guidance. Ludwig had always planned on one day seizing that rule for himself. He was, after all, the architect behind much of the power Hannah Sark wielded. So who better to rule than he? Ludwig rightly should be the one to rule. It would require great care, though. In spite of everything else, Hannah Sark was a profoundly dangerous man. His occult abilities were not to be taken lightly. With a gesture from Ludwig... Erica removed her agil from the back of the woman's head. She was ready. It was time. Ludwig bent close and pressed his fingers to the sides of her temples. He let the last necessary components of his own unique conjuring, conjuring he himself had created, finally flow into the woman. 
it would give her the last part of what she needed in order to be able to provide what he sought. Her mouth hung open as she shook. Her one eye stared, unblinking. He took his fingers away. She sagged. Speak of what you see, he said in a voice edged with anticipation. They come, she said in a hoarse voice. Chapter 81 Ludwig Dreyer straightened with a frown. This was not typically how prophecy sounded, but he knew from everything that had been properly done that it somehow was prophetic. They come? Who comes? Those with teeth, the woman said in a hoarse, raw voice. They come to devour you. Ludwig frowned. It was about the strangest prophecy he had ever heard. He had seen this phenomenon before. On rare occasion, rather than a distant prophecy, those he had prepared gave more of a vision of the immediate future, a telling of what they saw elsewhere in the world at that moment, of things about to take place. Those with teeth? The unholy half-dead, she whispered. They come. Ludwig made a face. I don't understand. He does. He does? Who? What are you talking about? Who understands? And what exactly does he understand? You need to be more... He knows what you do, Ludwig Dreyer, and he knows that you will betray him. He is with a spirit from beyond the veil now, a spirit from the world I can now see into, a spirit who knows of your treachery. The spirit king has told Hannah Sark what you do, what you have done, of your secret betrayals, and of what you plan to do. Hannah Sark knows of your deceptions and the things you keep from him, the lust you have in your heart for his rule. He knows, too, that in your vanity you have come to think of yourself as Lord Dreyer. He knows it all. The spirit king has told him everything. Most of all... The spirit king knows of your meddling in the underworld, his world. He and Hannah Sark have sent the Shantuck, the half-people, to hunt the abbey for your blood, to rip your heart out. For your treachery, he sent them to eat the flesh off your bones. They come. They come. Ludwig felt a trickle of sweat running down between his shoulder blades. He felt goosebumps on his arms and panic swelling in his heart. He looked up at the moored Sith. She looked confused and more than worried. Seeing fear in a moored Sith's eyes was something that made Ludwig's heart race even faster. She was, after all, supposed to protect him. But she knew what the Shantuck were. She had reason to feel fear. He snatched up a knife from a small table to the side and pulled it deeply across the woman's throat. She struggled to breathe through the burble of blood. Her tangled and broken arms thrashed a moment, and then she sagged and began to go still as blood pumped out the opening in her throat. Erica looked up. What do we do now? He licked his lips as his mind raced. We need more information, better information. We need a better quality person to stand at the cusp between worlds, a person who is more familiar with such things and would be better able to pull more informative details from beyond for us. The Mother Confessor? Ludwig Dreyer nodded. Have you started the preparations on her? Yes, Abbot. I've been letting Otto, the eunuch, begin to prepare her, put her in pain. Dora has supervised the work and made sure that her agony has been properly begun. I have personally watched her struggle. Ludwig nodded through his distracted thoughts. We can't afford to wait any longer. Get another Mord Sith to assist you. He looked up into Erica's blue eyes. Come get me just as soon as you... He gestured down at the twisted form at his feet, where he stood in the blood running across the floor. As soon as you get her to the cusp. You mean to try to rush her to the end, then? That's dangerous. It may go too far, too fast, and then we would lose her without any results. It's the only way. We must hurry it along. We must try. Abbott, she said, an edge of urgency in her voice, don't you think that we should leave instead? Shouldn't we get away from here? 
I mean, if Lord Ard sent half people, and they are right now on their way here, we may not have that much time. Ludwig was having trouble ordering his thoughts. He looked around as if searching for salvation. Yes, yes, of course you may be right. Make preparations. Have the coach prepared and standing by at the ready. Meanwhile, have one of the others begin at once on the mother confessor. We need to learn more. Dora, send Dora. Her impatient nature seems fitting. Her swift cruelty may be just what is needed. Let her have her way for once. Erica looked skeptical but headed toward the door. I'll send Dora immediately and get things ready for us to leave. She was out in the hallway for only a moment before she ran back in, her eyes wide. Have it. We have to go now. What? It's impossible for them to already be. Erica seized his arm and spun him toward the window. She pointed. Look! Look on the far hills, there in the distance. Do you see them? They all look the same. It's the Shantuck. Ludwig stared in disbelief for a moment, then growled in anger at Hannah's Ark for doing this to him. It wasn't fair. Have Dora get the mother confessor. We'll have to take her with us. Erica grabbed his coat sleeve as he started to turn away. I don't think we can wait that long, she pointed out the window. Whitish figures poured down over the distant hills. They will be here soon. He ran his hand across his throat as he glanced out the window. You're right. He started toward the door. But the mother confessor is too valuable to leave behind. Don't take the time to explain it to Dora. Just tell her to get the mother confessor and bring her along. Tell her to hurry. That will still take time. Getting her unchained and down to the stables will take time. We would have to wait. You're right. He licked his lips. Tell her, tell her to bring the mother confessor to the citadel in Saavedra. You and I will start out immediately. She can meet us there. What if she doesn't get out of here in time? He angrily waved off the question. What choice do we have? You and I have to get out of here now while we still can. If she makes it out, then she can join us. Erica looked relieved to hear that he wasn't going to wait on them. We're going to Saavedra then? He charged out the door, Erica right behind him. I know what Hannah's Ark wants. It has always been his ambition to overthrow the House of Roll. He has no love for Fajin province. He has bigger plans. Now that he has set events in motion, he will be headed to the People's Palace with the Shantuck Nation to seize power. He will not go back to Saavedra any time soon, if ever. It's the last place he would think to look for us. That makes sense, she said, her voice, along with the rapid strikes of their boots, echoing through the stone hall. There's not a moment to lose. You tell Dora to get the mother confessor and meet us at the Citadel and Saavedra. Don't tell her anything else. I'll get the coach. Meet me there. Together they raced down the hall. He had to get away. Later he would figure out how to get his revenge against Hannah's Ark. For now he had to escape the fate that Hannah's Ark had planned for him. Chapter 82 Colin thought she heard someone coming down the hall outside the windowless room where she was chained from the ceiling. It was hard to tell between the small, helpless, guttural grunts coming from deep in her throat. It took all her effort to balance on her toes in order to keep her weight off the manacles around her wrists. The wrist restraints were drawn tight by a chain running through a pulley on the ceiling and then hooked at the wall. If she paused to take a rest from the struggle to stay up on her toes, she couldn't put her feet on the floor, so it then put all her weight on her arms. That quickly made it difficult to breathe. As she started to panic from beginning to suffocate, she would have to get up on her toes again and stay there until her legs started to tremble from the effort, and then soon enough she would begin to slip and the manacles would take up her weight. Cuts from the manacles bled down her arms. Her shoulder sockets burned with shooting pain. She couldn't stand it any more. But there was no way for her to bring it to an end. She thought she would go insane. Off to the side, the fat, barefoot Otto sat gumming a hard crust of bread. He had a projecting underbite and only two teeth that she could see, both on the bottom just left of center. Both flat, yellow teeth tipped outward and hooked over his upper lip whenever he closed his mouth. His flattened nose looked to have been broken beyond repair ages ago, making it mostly useless for breathing. Since he usually breathed through his mouth, he rarely closed it. 
It was Otto's job to torment her. He would get up from time to time and use an oak rod as fat as his thumb to beat her across the back of her ribs until she slipped and lost her balance, making her weight drop into the manacles. When she eventually succumbed to tears from the agony and the hopelessness of it, he would be satisfied and go sit against the wall and gum his food or pick at his filthy bare feet. He seemed to have a fixation with pulling off strips of calluses. He never spoke and seemed to treat his job with all the enthusiasm of beating dirty rugs. He seemed satisfied when she lost control of her balance and would go sit for a while. When she would finally recover and bring herself under control, stop her crying and stabilize her balance on her toes, he would then get up again, come over and start the whole process over. Sometimes, rather than using the oak rod on her back, he would smack it across her thighs so that the stinging blows would make her weight drop. Colin thought she might lose her mind before they ever got around to killing her. She felt a sense of abject hopelessness. She had no idea where Richard and the others were, and she knew that they wouldn't know where she was. She was alone with merciless people who believed that torture would get them prophecy. She knew that, as it got increasingly worse, she would eventually want nothing so much as to die. Which she knew was exactly what Ludwig Dreyer was after. He believed that on the cusp of death a person could see into the eternal, timeless underworld and give him prophecy in return for the mercy of death. There was only so much a person could take. She expected that at some point she too would end up pleading for death. The footsteps were coming closer. The place echoed, so it was easier than it might have otherwise been to hear people coming. Otto was busy with his crust of bread and wasn't paying attention to the footsteps. They meant little for him, anyway. Colin's heart sank, knowing that it was probably the Mord Sith Dora. The abbey was mostly stone. The rooms were cramped and filthy. It didn't look like it had ever been swept. Dirt clung to cobwebs in all the corners. A light scattering of straw covered the floor in her room. The straw looked to have been an attempt to soak up some of the blood. It had done a poor job, but at least most of it was long-dried, she expected that there would eventually be a lot more of hers all over the floor. Colin was exhausted to the point of delirium from the effort of staying up on her tiptoes and so getting almost no sleep. Otto saw to it that she was kept awake on the rare occasions they lowered her to the ground for food and water. They allowed her only brief naps. The sickness she carried deep inside wasn't helping either. It was always there, gnawing away at her soul, it seemed. The footsteps grew closer. By the sound of the boots, Colin decided that it was a moored Sith. She didn't know how many moored Sith were at the abbey, but there were more than just Erica. The only other one she knew by name was Dora, a particularly unpleasant woman of average height and above average bad temper. Dora was the one who came around for routine chores, like bringing Colin food and water. She made Otto empty the chamber pot. She wasn't pleased to be doing any of it. She apparently thought that she deserved a higher rank in life than supervising the mute Otto and feeding prisoners. She looked impatient with the whole process of the drawn-out torture. Colin knew by the looks the woman gave her sometimes what she really wanted to be doing. Colin felt so sick from the poisonous touch of death inside her that most of the time she felt too ill to care. That only seemed to irritate Dora all the more. She seemed to want Colin to tremble at the sight of her. The Mord Sith would sometimes spin her regeal up into her fist as she left, pointing it, telling Colin that she would be back. The regeal was an implied threat of what the woman intended to do once she returned. On a few rare occasions when Otto had gone off for a time, she seemed to become impatiently angry with her lot in life and took out that frustration by ramming the weapon into Colin's middle. It left Colin nearly unconscious, hanging helpless and gasping for breath. Too weak and exhausted after Dora finished and left to get back up on her tiptoes, Colin would hang by her wrists for a time, unable even to cry. She could only think of how much she missed Richard, how much she wanted to be in his arms, how much she wanted to look into his gray eyes and see his smile. 
When the heavy oak door squeaked in protest, Colin looked over from where she hung by the manacles. As the door was pulled open, she saw that, as expected, it was Dora in black leather. This time Dora looked unusually distracted and rushed. Colin noticed that she had a key hung on her belt by a short piece of leather thong. The key looked to be the key they had used to put the manacles on her when they had brought her in. Colin wondered if she was to be taken somewhere else for the serious torture. She started trembling at the thought. She was at her wit's end, and she knew that it had not even really begun in earnest. She also knew that if the woman unlocked her from the manacles, it would be her only chance to fight and try to get away. The way Colin was feeling, though, and as weak as she was, she thought that she was going to have little chance of overpowering the muscular-looking Mord Sith. Not only that, but the woman would be expecting it and likely have her aegeal pressed against Colin's throat in a heartbeat once Colin tried anything. Still, Colin's heart was already pounding because she knew that this was going to be her only chance, and she was going to have to take it. If she wanted to live to ever see Richard again, then she was going to have to fight for her life. Dora gestured angrily at Otto. Let her down. Otto jumped to do as she wished. He unhooked the chain and then used his weight to hold the chain as he lowered Colin to the floor. He was not gentle about it, and she landed in a heap. The chain ran to an iron bolt set into the stone of the wall, so being let down from the ceiling was not enough for her to be free. The manacles had to be unlocked. Once Otto had let Colin down, Dora dismissed him with a grunt and a gesture. He bowed and left, closing the heavy door behind himself. "'Get up!' Dora growled. "'I'm to take you somewhere else.' "'Where?' Colin asked without moving. She was so weak, she didn't know if her trembling legs would hold her. "'You'll find out soon enough. Now I said get up!' Dora smiled in that terrible way she had. "'But don't get your hopes up. I promise you, you are not going to like where I'm taking you or what is going to happen to you there.' Chapter 83 As the woman came across the room toward her, Colin heard footsteps running at the far end of the hall. Then, in the distance, she heard a heavy thud. Dora didn't seem to notice the footsteps, but then, before she reached Colin, she heard the thud. Colin heard people running out in the hall. The Mord Sith turned just as people flung open the heavy door as they burst into the room. Colin was astonished to see three bare-chested men with shaved heads and smeared with whitish ash charged through the doorway. Their eyes were circled with black. It was a frightening, otherworldly sight. Dora's Ajeel spun up into her fist. The three men leaped for her without pause. The first caught the Ajeel in the center of his chest. He let out a clipped cry before falling dead. The other two crashed into the moored Sith, taking her off her feet, and to the ground right in front of Colin. When Dora landed hard on her back on the stone floor, it knocked the wind from her in a loud huff. With lightning speed, one of the two men, to Colin's horror, used his teeth to rip a massive piece out of Dora's throat. Blood gushed in great gouts as the man tore at her like an animal. The second bit into her face, raking his teeth over her cheek, pulling off a mouthful of flesh, gulping it down. Dora's feet kicked weakly as her life's blood pumped out of the gaping wound. She couldn't breathe. She stared up at the ceiling in shock. The eyes of the first man, his whitish face, smeared with blood, turned up toward Colin, as if suddenly noticing her for the first time there on the floor. His head lifted as he growled like a wolf seeing prey. While the other man feasted on the still-moving Dora, tearing at her with his teeth, the man who had ripped out Dora's throat suddenly sprang over the downed moored Sith toward Colin. She had been expecting it. With lightning speed, as he dove in on top of her, Colin whipped the chain around the man's neck, spinning him around in the process. With a grunt of effort powering her muscles, she planted her boot between his shoulder blades and gave the chain a mighty yank. The chain suddenly snapping taut crushed his windpipe. He clawed at his throat as he struggled to gasp for air. The second man, seeing what was happening, immediately jumped over Dora to attack Colin. As his full weight flew toward her, Colin kicked him square in the face, crushing in his nose and left cheekbone. 
he was stopped cold, clutching both hands over the gushing wound. The blood flooding back into his throat immediately started drowning him. He fell blindly, rolling over on his back, writhing on the floor, struggling in vain for air. Without a moment's delay, Colin used the heel of her boot to hammer his face as hard as she could. It broke his fingers, but it also crushed in the more fragile bones in the center of his face. She used her boot twice again in quick succession, battering his face until he went still. The first man, still tangled in the chain, had finally suffocated and was hardly moving any longer. Colin panted, catching her own breath. She could hear people racing up and down the hall, searching the other rooms. She knew that at any moment they would find her chained to the wall. She knew that if she was to have a chance, she had to get away. She could see the key to the manacles hanging from Dora's belt. Colin unwound the chain from the dead man and tried, but couldn't quite reach the key with her fingers. She switched positions, throwing her legs out instead because they would have a longer reach. She stretched the chain to its full length and was able to get her boot over Dora's middle. With all her strength, she pressed down on her foot to keep hold of the body as she struggled to drag the woman closer. She needed the key off Dora's belt or she was going to be killed and eaten while still chained to the wall. With grunts of effort, she made jerking pulls. She kept at it until she had dragged the moored Sith closer. The pool of blood helped make the floor somewhat slippery, and the black leather Dora wore also helped her slide a little easier in the blood. At last she had pulled the dead weight close enough to be able to snatch the key from the belt. As she heard people running up and down the halls, and distant screams and pleas for help or mercy, Colin fumbled frantically with the key, trying to get it into the manacles. At last the iron on one wrist sprang open. Colin shoved the shackle off her wrist and went to work to open the other. With one wrist free, the second was easier, and she quickly got it open. She tossed the chain aside and ran to the door. Catching her breath, she flattened herself back against the wall behind the door, just as several more of the same kind of people charged through the doorway and into the room. Like a pack of hungry scavengers, the people dove onto the body of the moored Sith. Some of them tore into the exposed flesh of her face and neck while others lapped at the blood. Others, unable to get in to feed, ripped open the black leather to get at her. Colin, her eyes wide at the ghastly sight, quickly slipped out of the room behind them. Once out of the room, she raced down the dark hallway, not knowing where she was going. She saw Otto, or what was left of him, down a side hall with at least a dozen of the whitewashed savages growling and tearing at him with their teeth. She realized that the thud she had heard at first was probably the attackers taking Otto down. When she heard someone in the distance and saw shapes coming around the corner, Colin quickly ducked down a stairwell. She bounded down the stairs three at a time and then raced down the dark hall at the bottom. She didn't know how many bloodthirsty monsters were after her or how close they might be. She ran for her life without looking back. She could hear the noise of other terrified people running. Racing past rooms, she looked through one open door and saw a number of the whitish figures piled on several servants lying dead on the floor, tearing at them with their teeth or lapping up the blood. She thought that the underworld itself must have opened up, and the dead were feasting on the living. As she raced down the hall, she heard someone coming from the other end. As they rounded a corner, she saw that they were more of the cannibals. When they saw her, they broke into a dead run toward her. Colin ducked into a room to the side. She slammed shut the door, but there was no bolt. Fortunately, there was no one inside. She stood with her back against the door, panting to get her breath. There was a small fire going in the fireplace. Bodies crashed against the other side of the door. She used all her weight and strength and managed to hold it shut each time an attacker rammed into it. As she looked around, she spotted a sword on a table. After the next time they thudded into the door, she let go and raced for the table. Behind her, the door crashed open. Colin drew the sword as she turned, flinging the scabbard aside. Without an instant's pause, she swung, nearly decapitating the first man to rush at her. She spun out of the way of the next man, and as she came back around, she thrust the blade through his heart from behind. Colin had grown up learning how to use a sword, but it wasn't until Richard had given her lessons that she really became an expert with a weapon. 
Now, with the weapon in her hands, she felt that she at least had a fighting chance. She used all her skill and knowledge to desperately slash, hack, and stab the onslaught of attackers and defend herself. It wasn't as hard as it might have been because the men all rushing in at her were not armed and they weren't trying to fight back. They only seemed to want to bite her, so the only weapon they used was their teeth. Still, there were too many of them. More were rushing into the room all the time. As they raced into the room, some fell over the bodies on the floor. Colin stabbed them as fast as she could. Between frantic slashes and stabs, she glanced over her shoulder at the window. The room was on the ground floor. Right after a particularly frenzied hacking attack to drive the men back, when she had a brief opening before they piled in at her again, she turned and raced across the room. She dove feet first through the window. Fortunately, the two side-hinged halves of the window flew open rather than the glass breaking and slashing her. She landed hard and rolled across the ground. As she sprang to her feet, she saw the ashen people pouring like a flood out through the window. Others prowling the grounds outside saw her come out of the building and joined in the pursuit. There was no way she could fight them all. Colin turned and ran. The enemy was right on her heels. Chapter 84 Rounding the corner of a vine-covered stone outbuilding at full speed, branches of shrubs flashing past her face, slapping her arms, the savages right behind her, Colin ran headlong into a wall of a man. It was Richard. In that first fraction of an instant, that infinitesimal spark of time, her thought was that she had to be mistaken. It was impossible for it to be Richard. She thought she must be dead, and this was some afterlife delusion. In that spark of time, she was heartbroken and crushed because she thought that she had to be wrong. In the second infinitesimal spark of time, she knew that it was real. As impossible as it was, it was real. Richard had his sword out. She could see the magic of its rage in his gray eyes. Without pause, as Colin crashed into him, he smoothly circled a powerful arm around her waist, lifted her around behind him, set her down, and as he turned back, beheaded the first man to run in toward him. The moment of seeing him, of realizing that it was really him, seemed frozen in time to her. None of it made any sense. The whole world didn't seem to make sense. Being attacked by savage cannibals didn't make any sense. But then, in that fraction of a second, that spark of time, they shared a look, and she knew that nothing else mattered. Richard was there. The rest of the horde descended in on him before the severed head had hit the ground, and then the killing began in earnest. Colin knew enough to stay out of the way of his blade when he had it out. She turned and cut down one of the pale savages to the side, a woman. As the half-naked people with the black painted eyes rushed in at her, she drove her sword through some of them, and as she drew it back, slashed others. As Colin struck, thrusting her blade through a man, Kara threw an arm around Colin's waist and pulled her back out of the way of the rushing men. The moored Sith, with a knife in each hand, turned back to the savages and used both her blades whenever one of the ashen figures got close enough. Against their skin, smeared with chalky coloring, blood looked all the more shocking. It had seemed forever since she ran into Richard, but Colin knew that it actually had only been mere seconds. Suddenly, within those seconds, men of the first file flooded in all around Colin, shielding her, protecting her from the onslaught of the attackers smeared with white. Kara pressed in close beside her as well, protecting her from any of the strange brutes. And then, in the next second, the ground shook with the thunderous roar of wizard's fire. She saw a fierce inferno splash down across the hillside, the liquid fire spilling out over dozens of the chalky figures, turning them to black ash amid the blinding white-orange blaze. At the same time, a dozen men of the first file, led by Niki, charged into the stone building, going after the cannibals still inside. The abbey was three stories tall, and from what Colin had seen when she was in there, the place was filled with attackers. She could hear the sounds of the battle that raged beyond the stone walls. Those idyllic-looking walls, set in among oak trees and covered with vines, looked ancient. 
Had Colin not known what the place was, or what went on there at the hands of Ludwig Dreyer and his Mord Sith, she might have thought it a picturesque place. As it was, it was anything but. It was a slaughterhouse. Thumps of impacts came from inside the alley as the half-naked painted men were hunted down, while outside, out in the open, the attackers coming for Richard and other men met lethal steel, and Zed cast a deadly inferno of wizard's fire across the hillside, incinerating the strange figures as they continued to charge in, oblivious of the danger. And then, almost as soon as it began, the attack seemed to be over. There were no more of the ashen figures standing. Their bodies lay everywhere, bloody, with terrible gaping wounds and missing limbs or heads. Richard, panting from the fierce effort, sword dripping in blood and gripped tightly in his right fist, swept his free arm around Colin, pulling her in close to him, laying his head over the top of hers in silent, wordless gratitude at having her with him and safe. She couldn't remember ever feeling such a sense of relief. Only now that it was over, only after she was done fighting for her life, done running for her life, did she feel her hands begin to shake. It was over. Relief washed through her. She was safe. Richard was safe. Zed rushed in as she started sinking toward the ground. Richard helped ease her down. Although she'd tried giving him a smile, Zed wasn't interested in returning it. He instead pressed his fingers to her forehead. She knew what he was checking. She could feel the tingle of gift flowing into her. A black-haired girl ran up and leaned in beside Zed, looking down at her. Mother Confessor, you're safe. We were so afraid. We raced here as fast as we could when Henrik told us who took you. We were so afraid that we wouldn't get here in time. Colin her mind humming with the tingling sensation of the magic Zed used to infuse her with strength, found herself feeling better. She sat up and puzzled at the slender young woman. Do I know you? She beamed with pride. Her mass of black hair jiggled up and down as she nodded. I'm Samantha. I'm the one who healed you before, back at our village. Colin, feeling stronger, with Richard's hand helping, was finally able to stand. She remembered the village where she woke— but wasn't in the mood to ask a lot of questions. She instead basked in the relief of having Richard's arm around her. Thank you, Samantha, Colin said. I'm sorry I couldn't take the hedge maid's poison out of you. I can't cure death. Colin supposed not. She saw Nikki rush out of the door to the abbey. When she saw where they were, Nikki raced up the side of the hill. With a sigh of relief, the sorceress at last took up one of Colin's hands, clutching it in both of hers for a moment. "'Dear spirits,' she said with genuine relief, "'I didn't think we would make it here in time.' Colin glanced up at Richard. "'You did. But the next time, I'd appreciate it if you didn't cut it so close.' Richard smiled. Even with the sword still in his hand, he smiled. "'I'll keep that in mind,' he said." She had forgotten how his smile touched her soul, and his voice lifted her heart. Chapter 85 Colin gestured around at all the ashen figures of the dead sprawled across the hillside. What is all this? A long story, Richard said. Right now we need to get you both back to the people's palace, Zed told her. Colin knew by the looks on all the faces around her that something was going on. Is there a problem? I'm afraid there is, Richard said. We both have been touched with death from the hedge maid. We are infected with the poison of that touch. Colin blinked. She remembered some of being Jit's prisoner, of being tangled helplessly in the web of thorn vines, of having those awful creatures dancing around and bleeding her but she didn't remember all that had happened. She had lost consciousness, and as she faded away, so too did her memory of those terrible events. Apparently she didn't recall some of the worst of it. We were touched with death? I'm afraid so, Nikki said. Richard, too, at least before it happened. He was able to block it enough that at least it didn't kill you right then and there. You mean you think it still might? Colin asked. We can cure you both of it, 
Zed assured her when he saw the look on her face. But not here. You need to know the truth of how serious it still is, Nikki said with brutal honesty. You both carry death within you. You need to know that if we don't get death's touch out of you, you both will die. We can do that, but only in a containment field. The Garden of Life, Colin suggested. Zed and Nikki both smiled as they nodded. Colin was relieved that at least they had a solution. She could see why they were eager to get back to the palace. Now she was eager as well. Lord Rawl, one of the men of the first file, called out as he ran up to them. There are stables here, he pointed off to a building beyond the shade of some oaks. It looks like a few of the horses are gone, but there are still others, and there is a carriage as well. Zed heaved a sigh of relief. Good. That will help get us back quicker, and save their strength. We need to leave at once. Did you find the abbot? Richard asked Nikki. She shook her head. It looks like he's gone. I would guess that he's been gone for a while now. He's probably the one who took the horses, the soldier said. Richard's jaw clenched. We need to go after him. No, we don't need to go after him, Nikki said in the kind of voice that prevented even Richard from thinking about arguing. She swept a finger around at everyone there. And neither do any of these men. I want them all with us. I want as much protection as possible. I agree, Kara said. They all stay with us. Colin sensed something else was wrong. Despite their having just won a battle, there was a shadow of something over the assembled group. Colin didn't know what it could be. She thought Kara's voice especially sounded a bit somber. Niki nodded her agreement. You know what happened the last time we were attacked. We had more men then, and we were still overrun and taken captive. We can't let that happen again. Being in the hands of those half-people once was one too many times. Half-people? Colin said. Everyone ignored the question. It's more important to get you both back to the palace right away, Zed said more diplomatically. Colin's life is more important than going after Abbot Dreyer. Colin could still read the concern in Zed's voice. At the mention of the importance of Colin's well-being, she could see the tension go out of Richard's muscles as he let his anger over Ludwig Dreyer go. Up until that point, he had been in a fighting mood. "'You're right,' he said, his voice considerably quieter. "'We'll have to deal with Abbot Dreyer, Anna's Ark, and the Spirit King later, after Colin and I are healed.' "'Spirit King?' Colin asked. Long story for later, he said, not looking at her. In his voice, she could sense the same deadly weight of the poison that she felt in herself. She knew that Zed and Nikki weren't being extra cautious. She knew that the situation was serious, and they needed to get back to the palace right away. You can get this out of us, right? she asked as she looked back and forth between Zed and Nikki. The truth. The truth? Nikki asked. I think so. But you aren't sure, Colin said as she tipped her head toward the sorceress. Nikki smiled, brightening her beautiful face just a bit, although not as much as Colin would have liked. I believe we can, Colin. That's the truth. But we need to get you to the Garden of Life if we are to have a chance. Such magic as this requires can only be done in a containment field. Colin didn't like the sound of that, but she was glad that she and Richard were in the hands of the best. There was no one other than Zed and Nikki she would rather have healing them. Richard sighed. I suppose the omen machine will be pleased to have me back, and I'm sure it will have a lot to say about all this, he said half to himself, as he finally sheathed his sword. It did, after all, give me the key to saving Colin from the hedgemaid, so it seems like it knows something about what's going on. I need to find out what it knows. He let out another sigh. At least, before I have to end prophecy. Zed leaned in, his bushy white eyebrows drawing together. End prophecy? What are you talking about, my boy? 
Richard waved dismissively. As he did, Colin saw a ring on his right hand that she had never seen before. Long story for later, he told his grandfather. The mysterious ring had a grace on it. Richard, she said, reaching out and running a finger over the ancient symbol on the ring. Where did this come from? Richard gave her the oddest look. From a distant ancestor of yours. What are you talking about? He waved off the question. Part of the long story for later. If I survive this touch of death and live long enough, if I can even be cured of it. Nicky laid a hand on Colin's arm and smiled warmly. I didn't mean to frighten you. It's serious, and I don't want to fool you and say it's not. But I'm confident that I can take care of it. You will both be fine. Colin nodded, feeling a bit better, but still sensing the odd mood. All right, Richard said. We need to see to that cure. He turned to the soldiers. Get the horses ready, and let's head back to the palace. Won't be too soon for me, one of them said. I've had enough of the dark lands to last me a lifetime. I'd have to agree with that, Richard said as they started for the stables. We'll be home before you know it, Zed said with a reassuring smile back over his shoulder as he stepped out to lead the way for Richard and Colin. Colin thought the smile looked forced. Richard, Colin whispered as she leaned close to him, what's wrong with Kara? She looks, I don't know, she doesn't look right. Something is wrong. What is it? She glanced around at the soldiers of the first file. And where's Ben? Shouldn't he be here? Richard's face paled. We lost Ben. Colin felt like the ground fell out from under her. She suddenly understood the uneasy, unspoken feeling she was picking up from everyone. What? Gaze downcast, Richard swallowed. I tried. We all tried. We couldn't... A lump rising in her throat, Colin turned and ran to Kara, taking hold of her arms to stop the woman. Kara! Looking into those blue eyes, Colin couldn't speak past that lump in her throat. Kara nodded knowingly, her lip trembling just a little. She put her hand on the back of Colin's head and pulled it against her shoulder. He gave his life to protect us, Kara said. It was what he would have wanted. I'm proud of him. Me too, Colin said through her tears. Dear spirits, please protect him now. Chapter 86 Richard, off by himself, leaned back against the coarse face of a small outcropping of granite ledge, watching the small campfire in the distance. He could make out the shapes of the sleeping man. The light from the fire reflected up on a short, protective wall of rock nearby and up against the bottoms of the broad limbs of pines towering all around them. The smell of the fire's smoke and the popping of the wood as it burned were comfortingly familiar, even if these woods and this dark land weren't. The moon was hidden behind a thick overcast, but at least it had stopped raining. The cloud cover, though, made it the darkest of nights. Such nights were always disquieting. They always made him feel like he was being watched from the darkness. Richard was standing watch. Everyone, of course, had objected. He had overruled them. He wanted to be alone. Richard was relieved to be headed back to the People's Palace at last, to say nothing of having Colin and most of his friends safe. He didn't know what they were going to do about the spirit king that Hannes Ark had called back from the world of the dead. He didn't know what they were going to do about the barrier to the third kingdom being down and all the half-people and walking dead being loose. He didn't know what Hannes Ark was up to either, but he knew it couldn't be anything good. And he certainly didn't know how he was supposed to end prophecy. Maybe the omen machine buried for millennia under the Garden of Life, would have an answer to that question. An odd thought, that. A machine devoted to prophecy, maybe being able to tell him how to end its purpose for existing. 
Something told him, though, that regular, as the omen machine was called, held the key to everything. As did his discovery of the message left for him, for Fjord Grissa Ostdrauka, back in the caves of Stroiza. It was all too much to be a coincidence. He supposed that after they got back, and Niki and Zed were finally able to heal him and Colin, he would have a chance to figure it out. He knew that in order to do that, he would need to find the rest of the book, regular, the book about the omen machine that had long ago been hidden in the Temple of the Winds, hidden there back in the Great War, in the time of Magda Cirrus and Wizard Merit, back when the barrier to the Third Kingdom had been built. Magda and Merit had left him a ring to remind him of what was at stake. In the back of his mind, he couldn't stop thinking about their message to him. One problem at a time, he told himself with a sigh. One problem at a time. Don't think of the problem. Think of the solution, Zed would say. He reminded himself to think of the positives of all that he had gained. They had Colin back, and she was safe. He had managed to get Zed and Niki and most of the soldiers out of a prison guarded by the underworld itself. He supposed he had already gotten farther and done more than he would ever have thought he would be able to. He would just have to confront the rest of the problems in due course. Now that they were back together, he would have Zed and Niki to help, and at the palace there would be others with vast experience, such as Nathan the prophet. Richard spotted Kara walking toward him in the near darkness. He stayed where he was leaning against the rock, watching her come. She finally slowed to a stop in front of him. "'Lord Rawl, may I speak with you?' "'Of course you can, Kara. You know that.' She nodded, not wanting to meet his gaze. "'Lord Rawl, I have come to ask something of you.' He shrugged. "'What would you like?' Her head finally came up. She looked into his eyes. "'I would like to have my freedom.' Richard blinked. "'Your freedom?' "'That's right. I have served you honorably. Now, in return for my service, I ask that you grant me my freedom.' "'Cara, I can't do that.' She lifted her chin. "'May I ask why not?' "'Because I don't own you. You are already free.' I've always told you that you and the rest of the Mord Sith stay with me by your own choice. You were all free to walk away at any time. That's what we fought the war about. I have no hold over you but your desire to stay. She nodded with a brave look. I know, but I am still Mord Sith. As Mord Sith, I ask to be released. I ask you to grant my request. Grant me my freedom. Richard watched her eyes for a very long time. He had to wait until he was sure his voice would not fail him. Granted. She nodded sadly and turned to leave, but stopped then and turned back. And may I keep my Ajeel? I would like to have it, so that I may know when you have been healed and your gift is back. If I have the Aegeo with me, then when I feel its power return, I will know that you are well again. Of course, he gestured vaguely, his heartache making it difficult to speak. Kara, I'm so sorry about Ben. She nodded her appreciation. They may have been trying to take his soul, but they, in fact, stole mine. Richard wanted to do the impossible and make it right for her. Nothing could have made him sadder than knowing that there was no way he could. I wish you would stay with Colin and me. We care about you. We love you. She thought a moment. I know you do. I will miss you both. Where are you going? I need to do some killing. Richard had thought as much. He had a thousand arguments. He showed his profound respect for her by not putting words to any of them. I understand. She swallowed. Thank you, Lord Rawl. 
Again, when she turned to leave, he called her name. Kara, please, would you let me hold you for just a moment before I let you go? She at last smiled as she returned and slipped her arms around him, and he around her, as she laid her head against his chest. He tenderly put his hand to the back of her head and held her, wishing there were words, but there were none. When she finally separated from him, Colin was standing there. Without saying anything, Colin took Cara into her arms, hugging her silently for a long moment. He was a dear, dear man, Cara, and he will be greatly missed, Colin whispered in a broken voice when they separated. Thank you, Mother Confessor. She took a hand of each then. You both have been the greatest thing in my life, other than my brass buttons, Ben. I love you both. She released their hands and wiped the tears from her eyes, then wiped her palms on her hips. It will be light soon. Get an early start. I want both of you to get back to the palace so you can be healed, she smiled. Maybe I will see you again. You never know. Your home is with us, Richard said. It will always be waiting for you. Thank you, she said with a nod and turned away. Colin leaned against Richard as they watched her walk away. I love her too much to keep her from leaving, Richard whispered, half to Colin and half to himself, his heart breaking as he watched her melting into the night. There were a thousand things he wanted to say to Kara. He loved her too much to say any of them. I know, Colin said, choked with tears. Me too. Do you think she'll be back? Anything is possible, Richard said as he put his arm around Colin's shoulders. Do you think she'll be safe by herself? Richard had seen that Kara had a steel knife on one hip and the Shantuck stone knife for putting down the dead on the other. Oh, I don't think Kara is the one who needs to be worried, Richard sighed and gazed down at Colin. Well, it's going to be light soon. I think we should get all of our gear collected, the horses saddled, and be on our way. The sooner we get to the palace, the sooner Zed and Niki will be done meddling with us. He saw a smile overcome her in spite of herself. I would have to agree with that, Lord Rawl. She hugged him then. It will be good to get home. Kara will come home, too. I know she will. Her beautiful green eyes turned to look up at him. Promise? Richard could only smile and answer. End of The Third Kingdom by Terry Goodkind <laughs>